Hi, I'm Edwin. And I am Jack, and welcome back to the 950 Club. Whoop, whoop. Woohoo. How you doing? I'm doing good. That's good, man. I'm good. I thought it started off a little different today. Ask you how you're doing. Oh. Um, so what we're gonna do for the next two segments of the 950 Club, I'd like to call our anti-hero special. Anti-hero. Uh Rock and Nafumi. Yeah, these two guys come across as a little bit rough. Learned rough. Like they had rough edges right off the bat. Well, I think they're they're dealt a raw hand. Very. By uh, by fate. They, they kind of get kicked in the gut to start with, and it's about how they end up. Yeah. And it's an, a really interesting journey for both of them. First off, we'll be talking about Rising of the Shield Hero, which is uh, Naofumi Iwatani's story. Yes. How Rising of the Shield Hero is set up, it's in Itsekai. And in Itsekai is many variations from uh, traveling to a different digital world to reincarnation in general. Ultimately, the theme of reincarnation is apparent. With Rising of the Shield Heroes case, it's into a video game. Well, what I'd like to focus on is they have your video game elements, like you have your menu, you have your waves, yeah. you have your, you know, your upgrading and your leveling. But for an isekai, I like what Rising of the Shield Hero does because it takes a different perspective and it treats the main protagonist very differently very. than other isekai. Oh, yes. So, like, he, if this is an isekai where now Fumi is summoned into another world. He's not reincarnated. Yeah. He doesn't die and is reincarnated. There's no childhood segment. There's no, he's not transformed into a monster. Yeah. But where this is also different is the tone. Very. Uh, from other isekai. Oh, yeah. Because now Fumi, this isn't like, um, where some isekai will summon either reincarnate or summon someone into another world and give them a bunch of OP skills. Yeah. It's usually pretty positive. Uh, even if they have to deal with uh, trash mobs or um, disgruntled people, it's usually pretty lighthearted and positive. Rising the Shearhold isn't. It's weirdly in a tone where the elements are at play. Ironically, the reality aspects of it too. We're, t we're talking about, hey, we're short on money. Hey, we have to upgrade. Like, there's an urgency. And there's a danger, too. The show is very realistic in that in, in that regard. And I think what that's what they're doing. They're going for more... Um, they're not going really for extremes no, no. the way a lot of other isekai do. Yeah. They don't try to make Naofumi overpowered to start with. But he is one of the four cardinal heroes that gets summoned to deal with these waves of disaster that show up yeah. um, every few centuries within this world, it's different right off the bat. It's different in the sense that you're feeling like it's going to be one of those straightforward, it's okay. It's like, okay. That, you really do. Yeah. You really do. It sets you up. It reminds me a lot of like, what's the one? Almost Sword Art Online. Yeah. Well, yes. It's yeah. Sword Art Online, I do admit, is pretty much the strongest influence for this isekai. Yeah. To start with. But pretty quickly in that first episode, things take a turn for the worst for Naofumi. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because by the end of the episode, by the end of the first episode, you're starting to question what you're watching because everything turns. Everything, 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 everything. The show that you thought you were watching isn't the show that you're really watching anymore. Nah, and the, it makes it, per, like, it sets the tone right off the bat. I love it. Because Isekai rarely get that element of being in a video game and also of the sense of danger. We've talked about A Sentence of a Bookworm, for example, and that's a very, very different Isekai as well because that's more about world building. And, well, and I, yeah. I, I was thinking the same thing yeah. uh, with this show. There is a lot of world building, 
because that's where this essentially betrayal comes into into play because of some facts about the world that we're going to talk about yeah yeah so yeah with that first episode uh, with uh, uh nafumi being summoned he's a basic uh, teenager living in japan and he randomly was bored one day uh, he's technically a shut-in more i think about it and he's like whatever i just don't i just want to be at the library today essentially he'd saved his brother from going down the wrong path yeah and in pre- an appreciation for that his parents essentially let him live at home while he was going to school yeah and so he goes to the library one day and he grabs a book and it just happens to tell the story of this kingdom yeah, the kingdom with the four weapons, or it was some lines with that. The four cardinal heroes. The four cardinal heroes, and like before even reading or getting assumption of or absorbing the text, the book transforms him <laughs> to <laughs> to another world. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what is that world called? Well, he's summoned to the kingdom of Melramar. There you go. As he's awakened to this world, three other people are there. Yeah, they're the other the the other three cardinal heroes. Yes. Uh, the sword, the bow, and the spear. Yes, and each one is in a in a different universe. Yeah, which is very fascinating. A different universe of Japan. It was very interesting because it doesn't really that that fact doesn't really play out. No, no. Uh, much in later. Yeah. Uh, the only thing because it doesn't separate them the way it separates them from Nafumi. No. Uh, because they all experience this world as a game. Yeah, yeah, and they treat it like a game right off the bat. They're like, oh, okay, I've played this game before. Yeah, <laughs> which is yeah. which is awesome. I, one of my favorite types of isekais is pretty much being in a video game. In part of the tone with the first episode as well, getting that basic feel of like I am in a video game, nothing more, yeah. nothing less. Well, one of the interesting things is Motoyasa. I think he's the spear hero. Yeah, he plays it as a VR game. Yeah, that too. Which I I don't know if that was a send up to Sao. Well, maybe or. Or, or maybe in his universe, v- VRs are more common. Yeah, because the other two, I think they play it on the computers. Yeah, yeah. While Nafumi has no no experience with this no, world no. at all. But he has played games before. You get that sense of it, at yeah. least. I wonder if that was somehow intentional on the part of the king. I would I would say uh, intentional with the writing in general because of these four or three other heroes having a different experience of video games too. Well, not only a different experience, but a different experience with this world yeah, that yeah. they're in because essentially the, the 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 world of the the world of the kingdom of Melramark yeah. is something that they've already experienced through a video game centered in this world. Yeah. So they're familiar with like they're a little bit more familiar with the creatures, with the leveling with all these different things than Nafumi is. Yeah. And I some I'm thinking back now, I wonder if that was intentional on the part of the king and the people who summoned Nafumi. Good, good call because later on the road you'll see the the kingdom's actual favoritism, let's put it that way. Blatant racism? Blatant racism. Yeah, it's yeah. one of those things where like I said, initially you think it's just oh, Isekai. I'm an adventure. Mm-hmm. I wanna have my partners. They're gonna be part of my party. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's your standard isekai. You're summoned to another world and there are adventures. Yes. Rising of a Shield Hero is not cheesy. It's not funny and lighthearted the way Konosuba is. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not like... Uh, I was thinking of like, so I'm a spider, so what? Like the main character actually knowing how to grind and get power points right off the bat. Yeah, or, um, you know, like Slime. That yeah, time yeah. I got reincarnated yeah, as Slime. Yeah. So, yeah, no, this one's different. This one does spend a lot more time on the world building. Yes, yes. Yeah, which is, I think, very interesting. And I, I had watched this when it came out in... Um, 2019? Yeah, a few years back. And watching it now, I just blew through this show. Yeah, yeah. Like, it was like boom, 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 boom. And I before I knew it, I had watched the entire season again. And yeah, I'm like, starting with that first wow, episode. Wow, yeah. yeah. yeah because it just that, moves so smoothly. Yeah. Well, first episode is open and close. And basically, you see this uh, the four heroes about to be summoned to help out this kingdom. The king, Alt Cray, is this typical king. Like, a bearded, gray-haired, you know, looks like all wise and but the whole time he's having these dialogue with the three other heroes, not so much with Nafumi. And Nafumi is the shield. And the shield is obviously a weapon of defense. Of course, you would think like Captain America or stuff like that, but no, no. The shield is pretty much has his role as a defender. And so Nafumi, this whole exchange is like, hey, what, 
what's going on? Why aren't you addressing me? Little things like that. And right off the bat, you get the sense that Nofomi is very smart with how things are presented to him. Well, there, there seem right off the bat, they seem to want to have nothing to do with him. Yeah. Like, he's just like, oh, okay, you're there. Yeah, yeah. This like, guy. Uh, this guy, yeah. <laughs> um, and so... Even even the other three heroes, too. The three other heroes pretty much have, like, we have cooler weapons. What's the shield going to do? Well, you can tell right off the bat that there's something that Nafumi isn't clued into. Yeah. Because, like, he's not provided with as much as the other heroes. It's almost like, a, yeah, just... Nobody really wants to join his party. Yep, yep. And he's like, what is going on? Yeah. And so finally, somebody does join his party. Uh-huh. Malty, yes. Melramark, <laughs> decides to join the party of the shield hero. Only one. <sighs> and, she, and mind you, she's also the princess, uh, the, the first in line oh, princess. We don't know this yet. Oh, yes, this yes. isn't revealed until later yeah. that Malty is the king's daughter, yeah. making her the princess. Yep, yep. One of the two princesses. Of uh, Melramark. Yes. So she joins his hero's party, tells him to invest in uh, armor for her because she's his sword. Yeah. They go out and they exercise, you know, they, they go on some adventuring outside of the castle walls to level up. Then they return to the city after he's bought, he spent the majority of his money buying her armor. Uh huh. Then they go to, uh, they go to the inn where she proceeds to eat and drink and try to talk him into celebrating their victory. Yeah, sweet talking, essentially, yeah. yeah. He's tired. He decides, now Fumi's tired. He decides he's going to go to bed. He goes to bed. He wakes up to hear Malti screaming. He rushes to go find out, to go find out what's going on. She's not there. Yeah, yeah. And then now he's taken by the guards to the castle where the king and everyone confront him about having attacked. Multi. Yep, yep. yep. Attacked and raped multi. multi. Yeah. Now, Fumi is confused. He doesn't know what's going on. He has just been accused of something he didn't do. And this is where things start to go south real fast. For yeah, him. yeah. And, like, he's he's arrested initially. And the whole time he's like, what did I do? What did I do? What is going on? And the king, like, he's sent back to the kingdom. The king immediately, immediately dismisses him. And he's like, you know what? We're going to banish you. Screw you. And or is he going to imprison him? One of the two. Well, he because he's the shield hero and they need him to fight. Definitely banished. They essentially, yeah, they essentially take away everything and banish him. Yeah, he, yeah. He's now on his own. And it's one of those things where it was so, super fast. He's still trying to register this world. Mind you, this is like barely 24 hours of this. And so as he's leaving, Malty right next to the side of the king, you know, crying her plea. As as he's taken out, she has a, you know, she's behind the king, teasing him, having her eye point out and tongue sticking out. <clears throat> like, oh, shit. And, and she's sweet-talking the spear hero now. And, it's, and she decides to join the spear hero's party. Yeah, well, she I think she had originally joined the spear hero. Yes, yes. It was just yeah. kind so. of a ploy. But the spear hero didn't really know what was going on. Let's put it there. He's not that smart. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, In the- Motoyasa is not smart at all. No, no. Uh, here is a uh, buxom, you know, wrapping him around her finger yep, yep. and essentially getting him to do whatever she wants. Yep. And that plays out throughout the entire uh, first season. And oh my God. Yeah, oh yeah. They're, they're cooking with the fire, they're cooking with the gas, with the hate. Oh man. Yeah. And this is a show that get you get easily invested with. A wronged hero is very rare for an Isekai. A wronged hero is very, very like rare nowadays, I would argue. Well, yeah, well, uh, you didn't, it wasn't so this, I don't, and I think that this wasn't received too well here in the States because. No. Uh, an accusation of rape is like that's wow that's yeah. some serious shit yeah and this for the violence and everything else like it's not too over like too gory things like that like it's super fantasy like no the the violence I mean there's a lot of blood yeah uh, there's a lot of blood <laughs> but there's a lot of like uh, like uh, t- topics let's put it that way that center around this world that like oh okay ooh ooh boy well because they're trying to do something to Nafumi and. They don't let up. Yeah, yeah. They don't let up throughout the entirety, pretty much almost the entire first season. These people do not let up in trying to besmirch his name. No. 
and make him out to seem make him make it so essentially so that the people of the kingdom that he's defending don't trust him. Yeah. Don't trust him, don't want anything to do with him, will reject him and ostracize him so that he has to struggle in order to become more powerful. Yeah. And to get any traction at all in, you know, in doing what he's been summoned to do, which is to defend this kingdom from the waves so that people don't die. Yeah. And so you're like that's very different from most isekai. Yeah. In most isekai, the king is there to help you. Or at uh, least any resource right off the bat. Well, if, especially if you're summoned. Yeah. Even so, on, so I'm a spider, so what? That that one's a very fascinating one because the stats uh, level or thing is pretty much like the only resource for stats so, builder. So, ma, so I'm a spider, so what is insane. Yes, yes. That show, I mean, if you want to talk about uh, OP uh, characters. Yeah. My lord. Yeah, yeah. I mean. But, but it's a case study, too, because that one's technically more about grinding. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. And yeah. and Shield Hero does this pretty good. Well, there's with uh, like so one of the differences if you're gonna look at so especially if you're gonna look at so I'm a spider so what yeah uh, a lot of the differences that come into with that one is while it focuses on the grinding it's uh it's kind of a comedy yeah because it, there's a lot of humor with yeah. the interplay between uh, the main character. And her different, the different minds yeah. that she creates. Yes, and, and Shield here is a little bit more straightforward. There's a little like hints of humor because how uh, Nofumi initially grinds, he has to fight these orange balls <laughs> that bite him. Yep, yep. But you know, yeah. any which way but lose, he has to get. Uh, he knows right off the bat he has to get more powerful. Well, he does. It, it's pretty wild. It's pretty like see to your pants people are looking at him like you brought monsters into town yeah yeah well yeah. he has to use it in order because he can't touch any other weapon that's a key thing well that too. was his negotiating tactic yeah because essentially so essentially the kingdom the king has succeeded at this part um in his you know getting the uh getting the kingdom to kind of like dismiss you know, the frown shield. Yeah, yeah frown upon the shield hero yes yes essentially not have anything to do with him or flat out try to take advantage of him yeah yeah and so he uses those little monster, um, like the balloon monster, yeah, yeah, to essentially threaten people into doing business with him. Yeah. But after a while, they start to see the value of dealing with the shield hero because he's fair and he provides them with, you know, essentially if if they need something, he goes out and he gets it and he brings it back. And he has abilities to improve the the resources that he's bringing them. So they start to see value in this. Yeah. And yeah, Naf- uh, Nafumi technically has a stats builder machine in his eye. You, you, know, you can see how to access it. Like even the <laughs> before, the only hint of advice he got from the three other uh, heroes is, yeah, you didn't notice that. You just you know, look at it in the corner of your eye. And, and it pops up. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. And then sure enough, he knows how to stats build. And initially, you're off the bat, he, chose, he chooses the... Uh, alchemy stat or technically the craft stat where he can make medicine he's like oh that's pretty useful and that's another rare thing too like with the idea of a shield hero like defense the basics okay i'm going to be doing what's more resourceful for me right now that's an early indication that nafumi knows at least how to get his foot wet in the in this world well, one of the cool things about making him the shield hero is that yeah, he has to find a uh, he has he needs a sword. Yes, yes. He cannot fight. He cannot level up the way the other heroes can level up. Yeah, because he can only use the shield. Yeah, not he can't even touch a sword if he's in danger. Things like that. It's very apparent, and he doesn't have any uh, starting point with magic either. Right, he has to learn it all from scratch. Yep, yep. And so he. This was another questionable thing this here is, in the states. The, yeah, and this is where. We're going to have a discussion on. Yes, yes. So as he's as he's building up his name around town, uh, there's a slave trader that notices him and calls him to his attention, and he offers to sell him what essentially are uh, monsters, yeah, creatures, mon- monsters that are first. captured, yeah, yeah, captured monsters. Uh, but now Fumi's drawn to a sickly little demi-human. Very small and very meek. Yeah. And it's a half a girl, half raccoon. Yeah. And so I, I think that what now Fumi is thinking is essentially he's going to rescue this person. I like how the show sets it up, though. Yeah. Be- well, because he's so angry and bitter yeah. about the accusation. The betrayal. The betrayal and where it's left him. Yeah, yeah. And the realization that, you know... Uh, Malty was lying. Yeah. 
And so she set him up. Yeah, and it, it, he still still purposes to you know fight in the waves, but part of him is like, you know, what? I just want to get back to my own world. So this is what I gotta do. Yeah, this it's it leaves him with a bad taste in his mouth. Yeah, and it leaves him bitter and angry at this world, and he he hasn't been treated well. No, no. And so when he starts out, he doesn't treat Ralph Talia very well. He does not treat Raftelia well right off the bat because it's one of those things where he's bitter, he's angry, and he has to do it. He has to do it. And the questionable theme of uh, slavery, of course, very like, oh my God, why is this happening kind of thing. In this world, that's what you have to do. And it makes you think, it makes you appreciate where we progressed as you know, human species because slavery is still around. Don't get me wrong. It's still a, a yucky, yucky, horrible thing. Well, it's not something that you that they have to do. It's no. something that they choose to do in this world. They choose to do, yes. That's and it plays thing. into, and so I, I think we can talk about this now. Yeah. We can talk about the, so because these um, these demi-humans, I mean, there's human right there in the name. Yeah. But in this kingdom, they choose to treat them differently. Yeah. They use to, they, they choose to enslave them. And use them as slaves. Yeah, and it's a trade, and it's uh, currency for them too. And now it plays into the king. So the reason the king and Malti are treating now Fumi this way is because the original shield hero, the first hero, shield hero that was summoned, became a champion for the demi humans. Yes, yes. And helped them to establish their own nation. Yeah. And so, the I think because they're because in this in this country in Melramark, well not essentially Melramark, which you get the vibe because they are selling them as slaves, but you have these elements within the kingdom, including the king himself, who disdain and look down upon demi humans and mistreat them, enslave them, and that's where their disdain of the shield hero comes in. They don't want the shield hero to have power, yeah, because he's held in such re- high regard. By the demi humans that they look down upon. Yeah, and that's a, that's one of the first instances of the mythos of Rising and Shield hero, mm-hmm. and kind of like okay, prior heroes had different things. Cool, like okay, Rising and Shield heroes more treated like a folk hero. Yes, uh, the original the original heroes, and but it's telling that the national religion is the three heroes church. Yes, yes, at least for this kingdom, because mm-hmm. there's multiple kingdoms too in this yeah. world. But in this kingdom. You have the three heroes church. That's the sh- the the sword, the spear, and the bow. Yes, the shield hero is not included yeah. on there yes. whatsoever. Yep, yep. So essentially, you have institutionalized racism. Yes, yes, and yes, slavery, of course, like a trade. You know, it's a business, and this uh, world was was very savvy with business practices. Yeah, they still have slavery, and that's you know one of those things where it's just like, oh my god. Uh, and and that, he he does he buys Raftalia. Yeah, yep, and and he does it because hey, he's he's out of luck, and you know what? Maybe he's gonna do it for the right reason. But initially, with the tone, what, what I commented earlier, why I liked how they built it up, because like we were mentioning, he's angered, he's bitter, he needs, he's desperate, he's just so fed up with everything that he's like, you know what? Let me just get this over with. Kind of funny because in a weird way, Raftilia is like very sympathetic. You already see it in her eye. You're like, why is he treat, treating her so badly? In a way, he's just being a really hard teacher. Well, she's a traumatized child. Yeah. Her essentially. She lost her family in the wave. Yeah, yeah. So she's traumatized. She's sickly. She hasn't been treated well. No. Since her the death of her parents. Yeah. She's been locked up and sold. Yeah. And now she's being sold again. So she's not well. Yeah. I mean, I can't even imagine. And so now Fumi buys her. And essentially, uh, when you buy a slave in this world... They're, they put a magic crest yeah. on your chest. Similar branding. Mm-hmm. And so now she has to follow his orders. Yeah, yeah. And so essentially the king and the racist elements within this, this country have essentially forced his hand. Yeah. He needs to find somebody that will fight with him, will fight for him or yeah. with him. Yep, yep. And they've made it so that he can't find anybody. Nobody will find. Yeah, him. yeah. But it also for the story elements, it definitely ties into more of the ethos and the mythos of the shield hero being that folk hero of any creature and being of the world in a weird way. Well, I, I think that for I, I don't know what the author was thinking, but I think that 
this relationship for uh, Naofumi and for Raftalia and for the, the origins of the S.H.I.E.L.D. hero, I think that that's something that the uh, the author wanted to explore. Yeah. And that the show explores because I think there's a lot of healing that goes on later on. Yeah, same pays off. And because I was thinking that, and he this happens too because, and that's one of the things that I think that the the author was driving us in this direction, because uh, he's closed off all avenues for Naofumi. Yeah. Because at some point Naofumi does go to an inn, and there are three essentially like, I wouldn't call them adventurers, but like thugs. Yeah. Who try to who say we'll join your party, Shield Hero. But essentially, they want to take advantage of him. Yeah, yeah. And so I was thinking maybe he could have found somebody a little bit more disreputable, maybe to help him. Maybe. But it's not. Yeah. Yeah. It, it wasn't. It wasn't working out for him. Yeah. And basically, you who have been associated with this uh, thief, who have been associated associated with smuggler, who knows? Yeah. Ultimately, Nafumi has his ways, and ultimately, he needed somebody to direct to her, and the slave is that. And the slave trader, tra- he's like one of those characters that is not, you, you don't sense him being too evil. He's just a businessman. Oh, he's evil. He's evil. I mean, he doesn't even. There's not even the <laughs> the the. The creators, the, uh, the the creator of the manga and the writers of the show, they don't try to hide that this guy is, he's a mustache, he's a stereotype. Very, that's what I'm trying to get at. Like, so, something about it's like, oh my God. <laughs> no, no, this is a mustache twirling, like <laughs> 1920s, right out of cinema. Vaudeville like, yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. got his top yeah. hat. <laughs> like this guy is like, yeah, no. <laughs> This guy is straight up evil. Yeah. He's not even. They're not even pretending. Yeah. They they said, how do we how do we depict this guy as the most evil person <laughs> that we can think of? Yeah. Let's go with old school vaudeville villains. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's what they do because he even has like a tent. Yeah. And you're like, why is there a tent? <laughs> In the middle of the city. It looks like a circus. Yeah, I know. No. Mm-mm. But it's all facade. Facade, facade. It's all facade. It's and, not a circus. Yeah. It is, uh, yeah. And it's a dirty, dirty business. But what I'm trying to get at is that Nafomi, unfortunately, has become his business associate. And he makes good deals. And even the slave trader is pretty much like, oh, you're, you're smart. Well, the he realizes pretty quickly that Nafumi is going to help him out. Yeah. That Nafumi is going to introduce him to a lot of opportunities, and he does. It's not, I mean, the name that Nafumi makes for himself as he goes throughout the show actually kind of helps him out. Yeah. And so that's kind of unsettling. It's almost unnecessary evil. What plays out in the show is that he forces Raftalia to fight. Yeah. He uses the, the seal or the brand, the magical seal, to force her to do things and he forces her to fight he forces her to defend herself and he he emphasizes the importance of like if we don't do this we're not going to survive yeah but from that point forward he treats her better than she's been treated going along yeah and she she pretty much ex- uh, accepts it and right off the bat you get the sense that raftelia is one of those partners that hey you know what he helped me out at the end of the day and i appreciate it well he, he saved her he healed her because yeah. she was sick he used his potions to heal her uh, he gave her food. He gave her, you know, clothes. Yeah. He gave her a clean place to sleep. Yep, yep. And they became partners. Yeah. And all she has to do is stab these orange little balls. These are like level, like barely one, you know, orange balls. They grind. They they get as much attacks as they can. And then at one point they attack a really big monster in a cave. And, you know, that's where you, you see their partnership uh, blossom. Yeah. I think that's at the that's the point where Raptalia realizes that I think that she decides that she's going to do this. Yeah. And in order to be strong, she has to be strong with the shield arrow. Yeah. Which I think she realized at this point, this is where Raftalia makes her choice. Yeah. Yeah. She doesn't want to be afraid anymore because she has a flashback. She's, she's been having nightmares uh, about the destruction of her village and the death of her parents. Yeah. And she has a flashback to that moment where she's running from creatures that were, that came out of the wave. Yeah. And she's like, she doesn't want to run anymore. Yeah. She doesn't want to run anymore. She doesn't want to hide anymore. She doesn't want to have the nightmares anymore. And she she doesn't want to lose essentially what's become the shield hero is now her family. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she doesn't want to lose that. She doesn't want to start. She doesn't want to, you know, be imprisoned and enslaved and mistreated again. Here is someone who treats her well, protects her. Yeah. 
uh, not only, you know, forces other people to respect her, she wants to save him. Yeah. And so she does. She it, kills the monster. Yeah. She saves the shield hero. And that sets them down on the path of like being partners and working together to fight the waves. Yeah. And hey, you know, it's a nice progression because Raftalia initially is very small and meek, but guess what? She turns into a bit, you know, or taller, you know, as she levels up, she becomes taller and stronger and more elegant. And yeah, it's one of those uh, growing experiences like, okay, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Demi humans in this world change differently from, they evolve <laughs> differently from humans. Yeah. Because when they level up, they, they take on a, a different form. Yeah. Because Raptalia, in a short amount of time, she goes from being um, uh, essentially um, a young adult into a full fledged teenager. Yeah. Yeah, from leveling up. Yeah, yeah. And she, hey, it's one of those things where it's just a show. You, yeah, you see it to believe it kind of thing. It's cool. It's cool. One of the interesting and messed up things that pops up is that Motoyasa and Malti show up trying to say that they, they need to free Raftalia oh. from from um from Naofumi yeah. from the shield hero because he's been abusing her. Quote, unquote. He's been abusing his slave. And so she needs to be rescued. And you're just like, oh, my God, these people never give up. Yeah, and they're completely opposite of the whole thing. And it's just irritating to the bone. Now, Fumi seems to have made some progress in his darkness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, his relationship with Raptalia, his building his relationships with, like, local, like, vendors, like the, the armor. Yeah. Who he continually goes to visit. He's a cool character. Yeah, he is. Um, he's the first. I'm, I'm glad that we see him again and again and again. He's technically, the show. His, yeah, he's technically his first friend, and that uh, character is named Elhart. The character's name is Elhart. He's bald, it's similar to Jet in uh, Cowboy Bebop. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> and yeah, he's just like kind of. He has a chill demeanor. He's an armor at the end of the day, and of course, early on, he doesn't want to associate with the you know, wronged hero. He helps him out anyway. So he's like he senses something about the kid. He's like, you know what? I'll help you out. Well, I, I think he gets the idea that nafumi has been given a raw deal. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, and eventually he upgrades for our... Uh, he really likes Raftilia, and it's like, okay, you know what? Raftilia does have her perks. And he does comment on the way that kind of like the asshole that Nafumi's being. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. it, like you initially mentioned, it's kind of comical. It's played for laughs because he's like very dismissive. She's just looking at a sword and Nafumi's like, what are you looking at that for? You know, it's just like, oh my God, give her a break. Yeah, he's... he's, he's <laughs> He's very harsh at first, yes, yes. but he does over time, he, he does soften. He's almost getting to a place where he's okay, and that's when Malti and Motoyosa, Motoyosa. Uh, show up, you know, come across with this. I was like, when you realize how racist these people are and that they allow racism yeah. to come and accuse a shield hero of being abusive to his slave. Like, Technically his partner, yeah. Well, and the, to a demi-human. Yeah. I'm like, these people have some balls. Well, that, and it also ties in later on to the season because it kind of ties in with the church too. So It does, but I was like, are you kidding me with yeah, these people? Yes, yes. I'm yes. like, they just don't give up. Yeah. The spear hero initially off the bat is Nafumi's rival. Well, the duel, the spear hero challenges him to a duel. Yeah. And in that duel... He's supposed to free uh, Raftilia. Yeah. yeah that's so the purpose for the spear hero. Yeah. The shield hero essentially wins until Malti sheets. Yeah. She uses magic to defeat him. Yeah. And that just sends Nafumi on a downward spiral. Yeah. That's where he discovers the cursed shield, uh, which is a weapon that he will use throughout the show. Similar to like Akuma from Street Fighter, like that berserk, like demon rage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it hurts him. Yeah. It hurts him and those around him because it is a cursed shield. This sends him spiraling down. And we see this again and again and again throughout the first season. Yeah. Where Malti and the kingdom will come back at him trying to besmirch his name. Yeah. And mind you, like Nafumi is, you know, banished and he's, you know, trying to do his own thing in his own way. And they're still getting him crap. Him and Raptalia have been able to work together to be, you know, to become a team. Yeah. And so anytime he gets to a good place, they show up to knock him down. Yeah, yeah. And it's this repeated knocking down that they do that kind of makes him the anti-hero. Yeah. Because he just 
he just doesn't want to deal yeah. with people. He, he always has that build up where you can understand his frustration. And of course, we're you know what well, we're used to with Marvel and DC, from Batman to Captain America, we're so used to the righteous path. Bayman's, of course, does his own way, and Captain America, pure idealistic hero. Guess what? <laughs> Nafumi is quite the opposite when he doesn't give you everything you want in a hero. Well, at first, Nafumi, because he's been, you know, knocked down so much. Yeah. There's resentment. Yes, yes. There's hate. There's resentment. Well, he, there's hatred of Malti, mm -hmm. which is totally understandable. Malti and the King, which is absolutely totally understandable. But then there's like disdain, and you know, because he's been mistreated. Yeah. They keep destroying the shield hero's name <sighs> to keep him from, I don't know, for standing up to the... It's just a built-in, uh, like, preordained hatred towards the shield hero. Even the king, even the wise, uh, all-seeing king that probably should know more of the history, really dismisses. But it also ties into the show's uh, overall thing. Well, the thing. king knows the history. That's what I mean. That's He's what just choosing to be a racist yes, asshole. Yes. And... What, what I'm trying to get at is that he's supposed to be all-knowing, like wiser, because you need the shield hero. Well, that's also one of the one of the cool things about this show is that um, you kind of see the dark side. I mean, this show presents you with all sides of humanity, yeah. Uh, but you kind of really see the dark side. Yeah. For, I mean, for, and that's and it's not apologetic about no. what it's saying. Agreed. Yeah. And it's from an Isekai. And mind you, like we were mentioning earlier, Isekai is just one of those things where it's supposed to be you turn off your brain. But this one makes you think. Well, it's one of the, it, it's an interesting show because in other shows, um, the focus is on like the demon lord or the villains, you know, from the, the villains that you're going to fight. Yeah. But here, the villains are the government. Yeah, the government. And the government, the church, the people who have summoned him there to yeah. fight essentially don't want him because he's you know essentially what he represents yeah which is the hero and the the hero of the demi humans yeah yeah they don't want that they nope. don't like that this is uh this is a human first agenda for them yeah and they don't want now fumi around yeah. and now fumi struggles with this it makes him an asshole and mistrusting too. yeah he he doesn't trust people yeah. he is greedy it's not that he's greedy but in his mind he's decided I'm going to survive these waves. I'm going to defeat these waves, and then I'm going to go home. Yeah, to and he's going to do whatever it takes to go home. Yeah. But along the way, too, he interacts with people. Yeah, and this is the other aspect of the show, like like I mentioned with his first stat base with craft. Mm -hmm. Part of the craft too is selling and merchandising, and basically with all the potions he's created and crafts uh, with Raftilia. He pretty much becomes a merchant. Yeah, he does. There's a character that he meets up with that he helps. He's transporting him. And this comes later on, but I want to get to that in a second because what happens is that they have a wave. Yeah. Okay, we'll talk about the first wave. Yeah, yeah they, they face the first his first wave in this world. And he leaves everything pretty much to the other three heroes while he defends a town. And it's in the defense of that town that he saves quite a few people. And it's afterwards that because the three heroes essentially are not working together. Yeah. They're fighting these waves in a haphazard style. In their own separate battles in weird way. And not including... Even uh, though they're cool with each other, they still are kind of like dismissive battle-wise, which is weird. Yeah, they, they all have... Well, because I think they all become... They all come from different Di universes. Different universes, different game styles, I guess. Yeah. I, I guess. Yeah. But it's it's kind of a mess. Yeah. And now Fumi comments on this. And in the meantime, these people in this village are dying. Yeah. And so he he saved them. He helps them. With Raftalia. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I think it's too because he doesn't see this as a game. No, no. He sees this as a, and it's as its own world. He, he literally says that. And that's yeah. like one of those things where I loved it so much because right as I heard those lines, it made me think of Sword Art Online, my least favorite is okay. I'm like, yeah. Because he literally says, This isn't a game, this is reality. I'm like, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Edwin's like, huh, oh, does Jack. <laughs> Sword Art Online was a game. Well, it was a game, but it's one of those yeah. things where they made us like too like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll talk about that later, but it's one of those things where the philosophies are intact. Let's put it that way. Now I'm feeling your rage. Jack. Yes, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. No, no, I'm feeling your rage. Uh, I'm, I'm not agreeing with your rage. Fair enough. But I'm feeling your rage. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm gonna call you now, Fumi Junior. <laughs> um, so 
it's this it's so it's his actions in this first wave that essentially start to show people that maybe the shield hero isn't so bad yeah he he gets a little following literally the folk hero aspect the helping the people the people see it first hand like oh the shield hero helped us tar- town out small yeah. so he started off small yeah. and then he from, helped these people yeah. they want to join his party he finds ways to get them to help and the upgrade too. Yeah, and to upgrade, but by helping the town. Yeah, too. And so he returns to the slave trader because he has some questions. Yes, yes. And it's there that he buys an egg. Yeah, it was on display right next to the slave trader, and kind of looked curious, like, what's the deal with this? Yeah, so he buys one, and inadvertently he buys a transforming essentially it's a chocobo yeah a chocobo it, yeah, this a is gigantic a, chocobo the chocobo is from final fantasy if you're familiar with the game series and that's another strong reason why it's my favorite as a guy it's the only one where it really tackles final fantasy like every like game incarnation i can i can think of too yeah there's a lot of fantasy elements in the show yeah very much so or fa- fantasy elements but more of the sense of what final fantasy structure is even the battles too because the battles kind of a weird turn uh turn-based kind of feel yeah there's some interesting similarities uh with some of Nafumi's attacks yeah that as well yeah and then this magic in the uh the dialogue as well here and there, like meeting different characters along the way. Party system too. Party system very apparent. Going back to the slave trader with the uh, the egg there, a uh, chocobo. Falilo. I think they're called Falilos. <sighs> the egg hatches, <laughs> and this uh, chocobo like creature is. Uh, he names her. Uh, well, she transformed into a human. Yeah, yeah. They're like, where did this girl come from? <laughs> and it's the 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 Falilio has transformed into a girl. Yeah. And uh, now Fumi names her Philo. Yeah, to make it simple. So now there are three There are three in the party. Yeah, and Philo is quite interesting because, like I mentioned with those eggs, the slave trader is like, okay, yeah, if one, one, only one of them, a good chance of them could be like a god, essentially. <laughs> it's like it's like a game of chance. And initially, that's, I think that's how Nafumi was like, okay, that's kind of interesting. And he, he, he from rewards, he, or from the money he got from fighting off the wave, uh, one of his uh, rewards was some money from the town. And he's like, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll spend a little bit on this egg. Who knows? I need I need uh, more party members anyway. But hey, he got lucky. Yes, he did. <laughs> uh, she's very, very rare. Yeah. Um, and now that he has her she wants she eats like crazy yeah, she loves yeah. to eat she's very child high high, high maintenance yeah. <laughs> she's very young uh and she's um they there's a, an entire quest where they they search to find her clothing yeah it's and a good episode i like that episode actually. it was a good episode yeah. Well, this is the well, this is where he starts to get. There's more world building. Yes, yes. And you start to see the ramifications of the hero's actions. Yes, yes. Uh, there's the the dragon that the sword that they've hero killed. Kill, yeah, the sword hero kills. Yeah, specifically. There's the nation that gets freed by the bow uh, bow, bow hero. And then there's the 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 the, uh, the plant. The plant creature. Yeah, the, the yeah. spear hero had a deal with the town with these seeds, and it really messed up the town. Well, their harvest, um, they, they were essentially, uh, their harvest hadn't produced, and so the spear hero found them the seed that was a, a magical seed. Yeah. And so this is where now Fumi starts to deal with the messes that the, the other heroes, the other Cardinal heroes have created. But this is also where he starts to learn about the about trading, trading and, the and mer- traveling, the, mer- the leveling up his skill with sale, uh, merchant yeah. uh, merchant perk. Yeah, it's where Philo, and this is where Philo really plays a strong part as a party member, um, almost to the same capacity that uh, Ralph Talia played in that in she, the battles, yeah. well, she opens up the world for them essentially, yeah. like because she's able to pull. She wants a cart. Yeah, she loves. She loves, the, she loves pulling those wagons. She's technically a chocobo. Like yeah. we're not exaggerating. <laughs> uh, yeah, she she's a horse that turns into a human. Yeah, yeah. And so she loves pulling this cart around, <laughs> and I, that's how they're getting around. I There's love it. The I three of it. them. <laughs> and so this this um, they're carrying this merchant who has a bunch of goods with him, and they get attacked by bandits. Yeah. And they beat the bandits so bad that. Uh, uh, now Fumi essentially he ends up 
ripping them off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they beat them so bad that he's like, well, and they're like, well, we're not going to get anything from this. He's like, or they're like, no. What they tell him is that, well, you're the shield hero. When you when you turn us into the police, they're just gonna. We'll just say that you attacked us, and they'll let you. They'll they'll let us go. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, hmm. Well, I am the shield hero, and you've heard the things about me. <laughs> so maybe I'll let you. And then they they're like, what? Yeah, now Fumi is wise. He is. Yep. He's he, like, well, maybe I'll spare you. Maybe I'll spare your lives. And he, they're, they they get scared. Yeah. And he's like, well, what are you going to give me? And they're like, what? Yeah. And that's, that's not the way this works. Yeah. And that's also a really cool thing about the show, too, like yeah. how people communicate with each other. Intel. Yeah. Essentially Intel. Well, not only Intel, but people communicate with each Well, there, there's definitely the gossip yeah. that spreads around. Yeah. Starting yeah. off with the, the, the fake news of Nafumi, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because it's the, the kingdom keeps spreading this information that the the shield hero is violent and the shield hero is this and the, the, all the negative aspects that they want to yeah they spread these rumors around you know about the shield hero and these bandits think that they could use it to their advantage but he takes advantage of them taking everything they have and uh and sparing their lives yeah and the 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 traitor says that was very shrewd of you. Rotali is not pleased. <laughs> She's not pleased. She doesn't want to be a bandit. She no, doesn't no. want to take advantage of people. Yeah. She doesn't like this aspect of Nafumi. Yeah. Rotali is very patient, even with the inclusion of Ophelia or Philo. She's kind of jelly, kind of jelly, because uh, Philo is technically a you know a kid and you know needs all attention in the world. Well, <laughs> Isekai tend to focus on. And, you know, we've talked about this. We've talked about the nature of anime and harems. And I like that they it's just the two of them. I'm very happy with that. Yeah. He hasn't. Well, the second season, he he tend, he, he, he seems to pick up another one. Yeah, well. And even in this season, he, he picks up Malti. Yeah. And you can tell that each one of the female characters has some level of attraction to Nafumi. In a way, but very respectful, oddly enough. Well, yeah, I, I like the way that this show doesn't play that out. No, no, no. They, it's they, not... They, they, I'm pretty sure they're sure, um, and they, they know of that aspect, too, at least with the characters. Well, it's very lighthearted, and it's very, I don't want to say adorable, but the way it plays out is very, like you said, respectful. Respectful. And yeah. it, it's one of those things where it's just a nice little, okay, we're, we're doing this together kind of thing. Not like, hey, 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 you know, I'm well, going to marry. <laughs> only Raftalia is the only one where she definitely has a parent attraction. Well, I think I think Raftalia, her her emotions for Naofumi uh, are, are a lot closer to love. Yeah. Um, where Philo wants, Philo's a child. Child. She wants attention. Yeah. And with Melty, Melty, oh, yeah. Melty, or Melty, Melty, that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, she's the other princess. With her, I think that I don't know that it's so much attraction or attention, more like she sees him as a brother. That, and she wants approval from him. Approval. Yeah. She At, does because you know she is powerful. She she does have the help, yeah. but because of Nafumi's very well, g- begrudging with the, the government and her association as a princess, which he finds out, he's like, "Oh, I don't, I can't trust this woman." Well, the the men in these women's lives aren't that great either. That too, that too, that too. I mean, Melty's father is you the, know the bastard king. Yep, a douche, douche, <laughs> uh, king douche, king douche. You get this sense that while it's there, I like that it's played down. Yeah, uh, it's played down. And it's balanced out with all the other elements. Yeah. And going back to the bandits, I like how even these little side characters have some dialogue and intelligence to them. Yeah. Uh, which is unusual for a lot of isekai. Very much so. Like, yeah. uh, like I was mentioning earlier with the slave trader, with the merchant that helps out Nefumi. Something about him is like very fascinating in the sense of like, okay, wh- why, why are they so successful in this world as businessmen at the end of the day? Makes you think. Well, with the with the slave trader, like I said, they it's, weren't. I know it's a, f- a facade and all that. Well, not, not even a facade. I mean, they were going for a stereotype. He is who he is. Yes, yes. And they don't play with that. That's what I mean. The trader is a little. You can tell that the trader is all about making the deal. Yeah, he's all about making the deal. He sees Nalfumi's shrewdness as a positive. That's we're, what I mean. Like we're kind of ra- giving building blocks, yeah. Yeah, where Raftalia is like, this is a little bit distasteful, yeah. but she doesn't condemn it. No. 
Uh, but it's another way that now Fumi sees to uh, help himself out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in order to reach his goals. Yeah. And he becomes pretty good at it. Not only does he become pretty good at it, but it's another way that he finds to whether he's doing it intentionally or not. He's helping people. Yeah. And ultimately, as we were mentioning with this middle part of the show, or at least like the beginning first half of the uh, the show, is the S.H.I.E.L.D. hero cleaning up the messes of the three other heroes, mm -hmm. talking with the people. And then sure enough, near the halfway point is the second wave. And how these waves are determined is a month-long uh, hourglass system. Like that's that's when they know the next wave's coming. This is another fascinating aspect of the show because they're like they've done this for so long. They're like, oh yeah, next month uh, we're gonna have all these demons coming from the sky, all these stupid monsters we have to deal with again. <sighs> we just have to summon these heroes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing. Like, okay, we have this hourglass. It helps. Well, this, you this is a society built around. Um, <laughs> You know, built around these disasters and built around the heroes. Yeah. And you can, and that's apparent in the world building because you have even the introduction, even the opening of the show and then the closing uh, of the season, You there's a throwback almost. And they, they introduce, so let's talk about uh, Melty. Yeah. So the way they meet Melty is that they're traveling and they find this girl sitting in a field uh, with Felilios. Yeah. Uh, this blue-haired little girl who's been separated from uh, who the people she was traveling with. Yeah. And they kind of like pick her up and say, all right, we'll get you back to civilization. Uh, but in the interim, they meet the Philolio queen. Yes, yes. And that is an interesting story in oh, and of yeah. itself. She is on – she's a next-level hero. Yeah. Or I don't pretty, know. Much, pretty much a de deity. Pretty much a goddess. Yeah, well, she's the queen of the Philolios. Yeah. And the, another interesting thing is that uh, Philo can become, at, at some point, she might become. The, yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean earlier, how uh, Nafumi picked her out of the pack because the slave trader was like, okay, these these chocobo, or ch chocobo like things can actually grow into gods. Yeah. <laughs> well, she talks about how she was raised originally by the shield hero that uh, of legend. Yeah. yeah. The one who um, defeated the waves. And helped to create, uh, um, you know, a demi-human nation. Yeah. And you get a lot of this history and world building throughout the show. Yeah. And it's really interesting. Yeah. And it, it makes the show, uh, it gives it this depth uh, that you kind of don't see in other, in a lot of other isekai. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, I mean, this one has to be up there with, you know, um, that time I got reincarnated as right, a slime. Yeah. Mushko Tinsei. Jobless Reincarnation or Ascendance of a Bookworm. Yep, yep. Yeah, Rising the Shield Hero, regardless of how you see now Fumi or not, uh, I think has to be considered as one of the best isekai. It's my favorite. It's my number one. Well, if, we know why it's your number well, one. No, no, Jack. Well, no, no. We'll for, save that for later. But for me, <laughs> the, like I said earlier, the video game elements actually being a little bit more of a factor and then also actually being a more resound factor. And also with the case with the mythos being steadily introduced and more of like seeing the path of the anti-hero blossom into the actual hero. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that in this in this series... They choose to focus a lot more on the leveling up than yeah. other isekai And it's do. rare. Very rare, surprisingly. Yeah. There's there's a focus on it. Yeah. But it's also, in some shows, it's like, okay, it's there. Yeah. And it's on their, their path toward becoming OP. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in this show, it's more about uh, Nafumi's struggle. Yeah. Uh, which I think was, which I, I feel is very interesting. Uh, and there's also a um, a development system for the shield that I think is very, very... Yeah. Well, he, the berserk mode is kind of like the wrong path, the wrong trajectory. It's there, though, and it's apparent. Well, whoever, uh, the writer of the manga, I'm like, man, you put some... Or, no, this is a light novel. The tech started off as a light novel. Uh, yeah. Started, yeah, it started out as a life novel. And they put a lot of work into the shield system. Yeah. That we barely see. It looks like there's an infinite amount of possibilities. Yeah, we and we don't see like this is almost this is you know a video game's worth of information. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. And the video yeah. game aspects to play because anytime uh, Shield Hero uh, levels up, he technically levels up usually a stat sh sharing party system where 
if Raph Tilly, for example, kills a monster, it gives points to uh, Nafumi. Somebody in his party, yeah. Yeah, that too. And it levels up uh, Filio too. F- F- Filo too. Then sure enough, uh, the other aspect with the upgrade system, once they defeat a monster or uh, encounter with something with the wave, he grabs a piece of matter and puts it back into his shield. With the uh, with the dead uh, dragon, for example, which was an awesome battle, basically uh, that poison dragon became part of the dark path. Yeah, and this is where it ties in with the waves because in the first half, at least, there's two waves, and then the second wave is very critical, at least for the story elements, because it was the first ever battle where all four are technically the first battle where all four uh, uh, heroes are encountered with the same villain. Yes, this is uh, so. Now Fumi has been working on leveling up his shield. Yes, yes. Uh, leveling up his, uh, you know, um, Raftalia and uh, Philo. Yeah. And so he's gotten further than the other heroes. Yes. And um, I'm kind of like not sure why. Yeah. Uh, because they've been doing stuff too, but apparently they haven't been fighting or growing the way. Um, just different. Now, tr- Fumi is. Th- they're. I think now Fumi makes a comment during the. It's one of those things where once you pick it up, you're like, oh, okay. Because what now Fumi says, I pretty much believe in. It's pretty much they became complacent. They're just so used to the, the instant rewards in a weird way. I, I agree with that. I yeah. think it was. I think part of the reason now Fumi is stronger is because of, sadly, the betrayal that he faced at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the, the disadvantage in a weird way. Well, the disadvantage, I think, made him struggle and yeah. earn these things. And he, so there's a few things at work here. He doesn't see this as a game. No. Uh, the only way to go home is to defeat the waves. The only way to survive is to grow stronger. Now, Fumi realizes all these things, and they're made doubly hard for him because he doesn't have that support of the kingdom. No, no. He doesn't have the support of the people. He doesn't have a support of a party. He has to build a party on his own. Yeah. He has to grow and discover things on his own, where the other ones are pretty much given everything, giving giving, uh, people to fight with them. Yeah. And I think that they chose to do things maybe that they, that didn't increase their experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, at the end of the day. Yeah. Because they have all these powers and they're pretty savvy. Which is it. even stranger because they are allowed to, like, um, upgrade, essentially. Upgrade, yeah. yeah. They're but allowed the, to upgrade but, by the church. Yeah. Yes. And that and also the government, too, with the hourglass. Because hourglass, too, also uh, upgrades. It's one of those shows, once you see it, you'll be like, okay, that's kind of cool. There's little, little things to where it's easy to absorb, things like that. It's not complicated. It's just a matter of, like, how each episode progresses because there's rarely any arcs. It's just each episode has a nice little like adventure. Well, there, there are arcs in, essentially in between the waves. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to get at because that second wave is crucial. They finally fight together in their own way. Now, Fumi comes in to save the day, essentially mind you, this battle for the second wave, you know, it's, it's final fantasy galore because it's up in the sky with a big boat. <laughs> it reminds me of final fantasy ton. <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. And sure enough, uh, they face this really gnarly air air uh, monster. And the other party members are just having a hard time. And then somehow, some way, the coordination of Nafumi come in and save the day. He pretty much is, you know, he pretty much settles the monsters there. He had to use his uh demon sh- uh shield, unfortunately. His curse shield. His yeah. curse shield. And it takes a wind out of him. And uh Raftilia's role is very apparent with this uh wave because it's this is where their bond grows even stronger. She's more similar to Mako and Kill a Kill, uh, Nafumi's pressure valve. I can see that. Yeah. I can see that. Well, because he is internalizing all the things that have, have happened to him. Yeah, yeah. And he has this internal monologue that essentially takes him to his take him takes him to a dark place. Yeah, yeah. And when he's there, that unleashes the curse shield. It hurts him, and it essentially he loses himself to the rage. And Rob Talia saves him. I mean, he's able to defeat the monsters. He's able to defeat the monster, but there's a cost to him and Rob Talia. Yeah. Yeah. She's hurt. She's injured by the cursed. Uh, and this isn't the first time. Uh, when they faced off against the dragon, uh, she was also injured. Yeah. She was also cursed and had to be healed. And that's another instance with the church. But in this battle, yeah, she, she calls him back. She calls him back during the duel. She calls him back here. Uh, she's his touchstone. Yeah. Uh, she's become like that 
like you said, that pressure valve that keeps him from losing himself. Yeah. And then yeah. after all that, not when we pretty much showing the other heroes, hey, even with the crap you're giving me, I'm still the hero. But guess what? Another 180. And it turns out to be this uh, weird geisha like <laughs> uh, glass. Glass. Yeah. The fan wielding uh, uh, anti hero, like a. a part of the wave and she's out to destroy them yeah. and f- in a few blows she knocks out all the other heroes now F- now Fumi holds his ground and it's one of those things where she could have easily eliminated everybody yeah because what the time was up the hourglass saved the day yeah <laughs> she, she um she's unable to defeat him within the time of the wave yeah and so she's summoned back to yep, yep. wherever it is that she came from and they barely escaped yeah and this is when <sighs> <laughs> we see the the devil of the shield hero. Yep, yep. And this is where the kingdom comes back to try to knock him down again by spreading room, rumors that he's the demon, uh, he's the devil of the shield hero, that he's done so many bad things. And so they accuse him of kidnapping uh, Malty. This is where um, Malty... Malty the sister. Malty the older sister... The one that deceived Nafumi. Yeah, decides that she's done. She's going to take out the shield hero. Not only is she going to take out the shield hero, she's going to take out her sister, and she's going to be next in line to be queen. Literally. Yeah. Because yeah, part of the aspect of the show, we haven't really talked much more about. During the first half, it's kind of like a nice little build because you get to see these other people kind of helping out Nafumi at times, whether he knows it or doesn't know it. And these people are called shadows. And they're like messengers. They wear all black. And they're like, dare I say, you know, they have this weird, weird tagline. And sure enough, they the shadows work for the queen. Yes. Or Malty Malty's mother. Yes. And she's kind of like a... Uh, what's that word? There, I think there's a political term for it. When a queen and a king separate, but they're in different ruling classes, they kind of like share the power. Well, she, in this world, it's the queen that has all the she power. She has all the power, but in a weird way, like, okay, the, technically the king is technically a thing. There you yeah. go. So the way this plays out is that the essentially that the this kingdom, the queen essentially went to kind of like a UN meeting. Yeah. So the world's being attacked by the waves. So each kingdom sent representatives to a certain place to discuss what they should do. And while they were discussing this, the king behind their backs summoned all four heroes. Yeah. Just so he could be a dick to the shield hero. <laughs> Literally, yeah. that's why he did it. Yep, yep. That That's it. <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't get more blatant than that. Yep, yep. And so the in all this time... The queen has been trying to deal with the political blowback of what the king has done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because the- what was going to happen is that each one of these nations was going to summon a hero on their own. Yeah. One of the four cardinal heroes to lead troops, you know, to lead forces against the wave in each different area. Yeah. And that has a dragon hourglass. The king upset this plan really badly. Yeah, yeah. And so the queen has been essentially cleaning up the political mess of that. uh, And um, she's been unable to help the shield hero. So the way she has helped him is by sending her essentially her secret forces, uh, spreading them throughout the kingdom. Uh, helping helping the shield hero when they can, yeah, like giving him warnings or cluing him in onto things that he should pay attention to. So, like I said, the queen has been dealing with this political blowback, and she's been sending essentially her spies out to help Nafumi in the small ways that they can. Yeah, but now Malti, or mine as her is her uh, adventure traveling name, the princess, she has lost it. Yeah. She's lost it. Her sister, her little sister has pissed her off. She has. And I, I think, too, that I'm not trying to defend this woman in any <laughs> way, shape but or form. In a way, she's kind of brainwashed with the church. Well, she has her own ambitions. She's kind of stuck between the king and the queen yeah. and her little sister who is, you know, in line for the throne when she's not. And so um, Malti is a spoiled brat. Yep, yep. And she loses it. And so she frames the shield hero saying that he has kidnapped her little sister and is holding her hostage and has brainwashed her. He has some now the devil of the shield yeah, yeah. has this power to brainwash people. 
and he's been using it. Uh, he's used it on her little sister, and he's using it on uh, Ralph Talia and Philo. And Moyo, Motoyasa has a weird thing for Philo in her human form. <laughs> because she looks like an angel. It's, I, it's, a, I, it's a gag. It's funny. I, it is, but at the same time, it's creepy. Creepy as hell. Don't get me wrong. And she pretty much flat out is disgusted by it. And she and, kicks him. And kicks, yeah. Yeah. She pretty much hurts him any, any chance she gets, <laughs> which I'm totally fine with. <laughs> he's, he's a colossal douche. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he, he just, he's, he won't even stop to think about what's actually going on, but he continues to confront the shield hero. Yeah, yeah. And it's this, um, it's this next betrayal but now Fumi seems to be stronger this time. He knows he knows his outlets at least. Yeah. Well, he has Philo, and he has Raftalia, and I think that this time he's a lot stronger going into this. And and also kind of like the weird, like we were mentioning earlier with Melty, like her how they're pretty much partnered and communicate his mistrust with Melty solvents a little bit. He's still a hard nose with her, and it's kind of you know it's one of those things where he has to have that you know he has to make it efficient. And make sure that Mel Melty is uh, protected in a weird way. Yeah, it's 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 it was an interesting it's an interesting dynamic because it introduces more of the royal family yeah. into this, and it gives you a different perspective because Melty is nothing like her sister, no, um, nothing like her dad, yep, and kind of like not a little bit like her mom. Her mom's definitely of a different like breed too. You can oh, see yeah. her off the bat. Yeah, she's in charge. Yeah. Uh, and so now you have, and now you, you we have to introduce the church, the Three Heroes Church, yes, yes. which has been kind of like it's been over overseas, and it's kind of fascinating how they finally kind of thing because the first ever interaction was when Raftoli, like we mentioned, was sick, so uh, Nafumi had to get uh, uh, holy water to ease her sickness, and this is where uh, Nafumi first meets the Pope. Yeah. And he, they try to sell him some jank ass holy water. <laughs> but he's smart. And he, but he's smart. He has, he can use appraisal. Yeah. And he says, "Why are you giving me that?" And yeah. the pope, the pope plays it off. He's like, you, you, "It's the shield hero. You need to bring him the right yeah. stuff." Oh, that was my servant. They didn't know any better. Yeah, right. <laughs> We're not buying it, dude. Even, even with the king douche, even with uh, the spear douche, the pope was my least like douche in this one. <laughs> He's the most self righteous of the bunch. He, well, of this world, of the church, and with this kingdom, with this religion, he had too much power for his own good. I agree. Um, he he has a weapon that essentially can transform itself into the three different uh, cardinal heroes' weapons. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, you're. Why aren't you using this to fight the waves, yeah, man? Yeah. And you get it because it's powered by the the faith and magic of uh, his followers. And this dude has decided that because the shield here, his racism has driven him insane. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, it's just his 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 fervor and his self righteousness has. He's bought into this idea that the the shield hero has been sent there by the devil. Yeah. And I, well, actually, I'm not sure. I don't know if it's just like his, just a power trip. I would argue it's absolutely a power trip. Yeah. But he's so he's to the point where he's sacrificing his own people to get more powerful yeah. to destroy the cardinal yeah. hero. And it is, and it's not only now Fumi that he wants to destroy. It's the heroes. It's all the heroes. Yeah, because the two other heroes, mind you, we we keep on making fun of the spear hero because he's just a dimwitted, you know imbecile who you know it's one of those things where like whatever I it's don't, easily manipulated they easily too. manipulated yeah. but the other ones are more kind of like solo based especially the uh, sword hero but both are kind of like oh yeah they're kind of like stubborn with their ways too and they did the bow hero and the sword hero are the only ones that kind of have natural kinship and so sure, sure enough later in the second half they kind of investigate the church they're like the church is kind of weird at the end yeah. of the day and sure sure enough uh they find the resources why the shield hero are so special and then sure enough the church pretty much like capture them well they they get set up yeah they get set up and the church tries to take them out yeah yeah and um i like the fact that they're not ciphers no no, no. um and that's one of the cool things about this show and we have to keep and then we have to keep reminding. It's one of those ones where you just naturally get the build of what, it. 
the 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 level of development is insane. Is insane. Yeah. Um, just the because there's nothing's really wasted. Nothing in this show. Nothing. I mean, you do, there's nobody's throwaway. Nothing. None. Um, every character gets a moment. Yes. And the the cardinal heroes have their own personalities, and sometimes you feel that. I mean, sometimes it gets it gets to the point where you're like. <sighs> Everybody in the show is designed to drive now Fumi crazy. At least at the certain point of the certain episode. Well, yeah. Let's just put it that way. It, it gets it gets extreme. Yeah. It's it's like it, it, this world is almost a grinder for to a grinder to make now Fumi into an antihero. Test his limits. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes you feel that the the characters are pushed in that direction. Very much so. But at the same time, they're not just standing there. No, there's nothing wasted in this show. And I think that that's why when you watch it, it's like it blows by so fast. And it's super fast and super fascinating. Because it's so well done. Yeah, it, it doesn't even feel like a grind. It's natural. Like like I mentioned, each episode's own its own mini arc in a weird way. Well, some isekai, you never know what the content. You, you start watching the show. And okay, you have your basic premise. Yeah. This person has either been summoned, they have died, they have been killed by Truck Coon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, somehow they've been brought to this world, and you're like, all right, what are you going to give me? Yeah. What What are we going to see? Are we going to see fantasy battles? Are we going to see OP? Yeah. Are we going to see the, the OP ness of you? Yeah. You know, but there's not really a lot of development. It's just like, all right, this is, I, this is what I'm going to do. I'm yeah. either going to do a harem. Or I'm going to do uh, the <sighs> story of this, you know, this hero. Why it's not really my favorite category. I know. Well, I mean, it, it's it's like any other anime. They they tend to do what they want. The creator tends to do what the creator wants to do. Yeah. Telling what story they want to tell and what areas they want to focus on. Yeah. This show focuses on... The, this show does a lot of world... Where a lot of those shows might not... They just want to do a fantasy adventure. Yeah. They don't spend a lot of time building the world. Yeah. In this one, it spends a lot of time building the world. In the smallest way possible because what we were mentioning earlier. With well, in the small yeah. ways and the big ways. Yes, yes. Well, I'm trying. Yeah. Because it starts small. It's almost like a tree. That little seed that grows and grows and grows while I watch the show. Like we had the instance with the filial queen. Like that pays off because uh, the uh, the queen, the filial queen, she saves Nefomi at the end of the day over this battle over Berserk uh dinosaur it's awesome it's one of the best battles in the show and ridiculous too <laughs> I, I agree yeah. and uh ultimately this uh Felio queen can turn is similar to filio where it's it, it's presented as a child but it turns into a big 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 bird <laughs> bigger than uh, a skyscraper yeah she's a few stories tall as edwin pointed out earlier she, she was originally trained by the shield hero and she gives him sound advice like this is it like you heroes are be, just being awful right now. Awful, awful. Even you, Nefumi. You're good. You're you're kind. But at the same time, you're just a little bit off the wrong track. You got to make up with these heroes. I, I don't... I mean, it's sound advice, but it's also, I think... It's hard. It's hard advice, too. I think it's common sense. That, too. I mean, it's, it's like you guys are the four heroes. You're summoned here to save the world. Yeah, you have to work together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, it, it's it's like... My thing is like... Duh. Yeah, but that's the thing about the show. Like, it's one of those things where that instance makes it even better. It just well, drives because me. It, 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 because it's interesting because you have characters that are di at different intelligence levels. That's what I mean. Yeah, you have characters that have that are stubborn. Yes, you have characters that have been put into situations, and they they come with those resentments. They're very well developed. Extremely. Yeah, and you don't get you don't always get that in a lot of isekai. Yeah. Uh, but in this show, they spend a lot of time developing the characters. Just like I said, like we talked about, even the smaller characters feel like they're more fleshed out than normal. Yeah, yeah. With the bail with the church, it finally is the inclination that, you know what? Here we go. Because uh, initially, Nafumi meets up once again with Malti and the spear. And Motoyasa. And Motoyasa. <sighs> And yeah, it's like a why are we doing this? And this is after he got the advice from the F Filio Queen. Well, now Malti and Motoyasa, now they have been 
told that uh, the spear hero has killed the other two heroes. <sighs> and it's like, Nafumi's like, what? That, that's it. And, well, I was thinking, it's like, do you even listen to yourself I when you know. think these things? I it's know. like, do you really think that? The, <laughs> it's like, what? Yep, what yep. reason would Nafumi have for taking out? He doesn't want anything to do with the the other heroes. Why would he even try to take them out? Yeah, exactly. Why, why would he do this? It's like Motoyasa doesn't even stop to think about what I he's know. accusing Nafumi of. I know. Yeah, and so. I was just like, what? Yeah. So there's there's their battle, which, I mean, the outcome is like, come on, man. Yeah, you're yeah. not going to beat the shield hero. Yeah, yeah. And then the Pope shows up with his followers, and he imprisons them, and he fights them. And the queen shows up, and she's like, that's it. Yeah. This nonsense has gone on long enough. Yeah. Now, Fumi uses his curse shield, uh, and he uses a, a skill called blood sacrifice. Yes. Where he actually hurts himself in order to defeat the Pope. Yeah, the Pope is pretty powerful, not going to lie, because he uses a book that has all uh, original weapons. Yeah, well, he uses that weapon that we talked about earlier that can mimic the three weapons, yeah, except yeah. for the shield. Yes, yes. And so that's that's the Pope's downfall. Yeah. And so now you get the trial of Malti and the King. Yep. And that was awesome. That uh, was very satisfying. It wasn't like one of those scenes where it was like, ha, ha, ha. It was like, okay. It, it was rare because it was like a weird, like, okay, we're in this point where we learned. And we come this far, like, what can go from here? Well, the queen, it doesn't mess around. No. She's a, she's a real leader. Yeah. Uh, she was trying to solve the waves and her husband. King. <sighs> douche. Yeah, he messed it up. Uh, he messed it up real bad because he let his prejudices and being influenced by the church, uh, he let all these things drive him down this path. Yeah, that he chose. Yep. I'm not. I'm not defending this guy in any way, shape, or I hate. I hate this guy. I mean, <laughs> this guy. This guy's fun to hate. Yeah. It. It's fun to you know disdain and hate these two because they are villains. Yeah. I mean, they're villains. They're bad people. And now Fumi, I mean, shit. Um, <laughs> Malti tries to poison him in one of the later episodes. And this is after yeah. he spared her life. Yep, yep. And I'm like, stop. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> uh, See, now Fumi. <sighs> it, well, what's fascinating about that aspect, too, because after defeating the Pope, after the trial, because the trial, uh, now Fumi spares the king and uh, Malti. Gives Which him- is... Which, when you, if you sit down and you think about that, if you what really, if you, what if you're in that scenario? Yeah, what if these people wrong. So you? these these are the people who have constantly and repeatedly come after you, and have hobbled you, and have every time that you've tried to rebuild yourself, they have tried to take everything and that denied you've done access to basic away. stuff. Yes. I know yeah. again and again and again and again, and he as a favor to the queen. He finds a way to spare their lives. Yeah. Because the queen was actually going to as they as they killed as she killed her husband and her daughter for the crimes, for the treason that they had committed against not only this kingdom, but all the other kingdoms. Yeah. She was gonna take her own life. Yep, yep. And Malti uh, I mean now Fumi had realized this. Yeah. And that's why he spares um their lives. Yeah. Uh, and he comes up with a pretty funny. <laughs> well, he, he comes up compromise. with a pretty yeah. funny punishment yeah. for the both of them. Yeah, he basically was like, you know what, this king, trash. His name's from now on. It's gonna be trash. Yeah. And this, uh, you know, this, this girl that keeps on portraying me, you know what, she's a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> and then, oh yeah, she has a party name. Uh, her party name is mine. Uh, we'll change that too. We'll change it to slut. No, it's whore. Whore, whore. He no slut. I thought whore. it was slut. Okay. He changes it to whore. Either word. It was, um, it was one of the things even I thought was like, ah, okay, okay. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's like, whatever. I thought they got off easy. Dual death death technically is the fastest way. And yeah, and being named that, it's just a little bit better. Uh, what? Yeah, I know. Um, no, they got off easy. They got <laughs> off easy, especially since she tries to poison him later on. I, I mean, know. they got off real They easy. could have been prisoners. Technically, that should, that should have been the punishment. Yeah, he they should have been thrown into prison. Uh, letting them walk around, I thought, was a mistake on his part. 
man, that shows a lot of growth on his part. Yeah. And mind you, this is one stubborn, stubborn hero, anti-hero. Well, I mean, it, sh- it shows that I think that Rafa, Talia, Philo, uh, Malti. and Malti, yeah. uh, no, Melty. Melty. <laughs> Melty, uh, yeah, that, I don't know why they did that. Yeah, I know. Uh, but Melty uh, have all had an influence on him and bringing him back from the edge that he was on. Yeah. Uh, I think that this show could have played out. I, I think that. And I'm glad that it didn't. I'm glad that there was hope in well, this show in because the, yeah. when if we, they had gone in the other direction, I think it would have been harder. Yeah. It would have been hard to watch. Yeah, and we're going back to speed with our uh, from our spring preview for the season two because I mentioned how this is my most anticipated new show for 2022 mm-hmm. because it was one of those things where how it ended, how the first season ended. It was just a nice little thing where Nafumi decides to be Lord. And during the whole... Th- season he's complaining 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 i want to get out of this world i'm only doing this to get out of this world and part of the growth you know being uh benevolent over the king and uh the princess he decides to become lord and make a sound investment in this world being like you know what i could die i could die in this world let me just settle in and this is a shock to reftilia because it's actually at her uh, hometown well he surprises her by becoming the lord of uh of her village yeah uh, of the region that she, you know, her village that was destroyed and the, the, the people that she lost. Yeah. And so, and well, this is part of his reward for not only uh, sparing uh, the lives. He, the queen owes him a lot. Yeah. He has spared the lives of her, um, her husband and her daughter. Yeah. And he defeats uh, Glass and her two compatriots in the final battle of the season. Yeah. And so the queen says, you, you you have to get something or I'm never going to start. You know, I'm never going to be able to pay you back yeah. for everything that you've done. And so he, he says, well, give me this. Yeah. And it's a surprise for Raftalia yeah. where he becomes the lord of um, the village. And it's a touching moment with him and Raftalia because uh, this has been a journey for both of them. Very much so. And it's 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 like it's coming. It's it's uh, it's a homecoming for her. And it, it's it's very he realizes that because they ask him why are you fighting yeah and he really has to think about it because up until this point he's been fighting for himself yeah. he's been fighting to survive and he's been fighting to go home because this world has not treated him well and he and glass I think it's glass that asked him glass and her compatriots they they're like why are you doing this yeah why are you fighting for this world yeah. Uh, you know, essentially they wanted him to give up and die so that they can defeat him. But he's going to grow stronger, I think, is what they're worried about. And they might not be able to defeat him. But what you get is now Fumi has to, he asks himself, it's like, why am I doing this? Yeah. This isn't my world, but it, it, it kind of be, has become. He's doing this so that Raftalia and Philo will have a world to live in. Yeah, and make them They will happy. have a place. Yeah. Not yeah, not only making them happy, but like if he does go home, he wants them to have a place to be. Yeah. You know, he want he cares about them. They've helped him along his path. Uh and so he wants and all the other people that he's saved and that have become friends with him, he wants them, he wants to fight for them. Yeah. And this, this is what I'm trying to get at because that ending, that conclusion, like, I'm like, wow, what a conclusion. It's just one of those things where the final two episodes maybe really anticipate the second season. Like, what else is out there? Because like you mentioned with Lark, or Ark and then uh, Glass as well, they're not exactly from the waves. They're actually heroes from different dimensions. <laughs> and that's a factor as well. This show is nuts. <laughs> Well, there, I, I think that was a wrinkle that was added. Uh, it's a mystery. Yes. Because yes. I end up with questions. Yes, yes. Like, all right, what are the waves? You know, what is this world? What's that other world? Yeah. What's coming up? Yeah. Um, The second season starts off and it doesn't answer those. And I was upset. Well, we'll discuss that. That's one of those yeah. ones where we'll give us some room because it's uh, near the halfway point with that one too. I'm like, mm, couple more. Yeah, I need to catch up with that. Yeah. Uh, I have not been, um, I have never, I've not been watching it week to week because I've been watching other shows and I've been preparing for the podcast. Yeah. So 
I will definitely be catching up on that one very, very soon. Yeah. And yeah. It's one of those things where we're going to have a spring catch up. And yeah, Rising Shield Hero. If you, it was a good refresher watching this for the first season. Because second season is really right off the bat. And it's one of those good things to be like, you know what? I'll watch the first season. I really like the first season. Yeah. Well, this show is definitely worth three. There's enough there. Well, first, it's 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 a lot more well done yeah. than like a lot of other isekai. In general um, shows, in general, it's yeah. it's one of my top twenty five. You know, I would say yeah, it just anime in general. Yeah, this show does a really good job of world building, storytelling, character development, the depth of like the the conflicts. Yeah. So there's a lot here to come back for. Yeah. yeah. And like I said, I I was like, all right, you know what? I'll watch like my what I usually try to do is I'll watch a few episodes a night. So that I'm not overwhelmed yeah. trying to watch it all. Anime does that for me too, yeah. especially. I don't I don't like to binge, but sometimes it's like sometimes you get into a show and like with this show is like seven episodes later, I'm like, wait, did I just watch I seven episodes? <laughs> yeah. It, it's wonderfully placed. And it's one of those things, like I said, it's like a tree. A lot of things you realize be like, okay, it absorbs in. It makes me want to read the light novels, to be honest. Yeah, this More is, than the manga, yeah. It this is this show is definitely a treat. Yeah. It, it's yeah. something to look forward to. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to see where they they're going with this, and this could be. Uh, I know that they're splitting up this season into two parts. Yeah, and so that worries me a little bit. But at the same time, I'm like, there's a lot of content. Yeah, to this show. and a little bit more too, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's still going. Uh, it's one of those things where hey, we're all on the what right? There's, well, there's. I think there's going to be. It's going to be shortened. We'll still get about twenty episodes, yeah. or maybe a little bit more. For similar, the... similar Attack on Titan, then. Okay. Yeah, uh, but you know, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I know that there was some talk about this season and how the the writer of the light novel was that was like he wasn't really sure why he wrote this arc to start with, and so I think they're trying to rush through it, and so I think that's why you're getting some criticism of the the beginning of the second season. Well, okay, yeah, and yeah. basically the whole gist of it is that I think for people that are going back to season two, I would strongly suggest rewatch the first season or read the light novel, get you guys back into the world, because even I am it, watching the second season, it was just cl- cluttered. It was like one of those things that Pushed too much in that first episode. It needed well, something. It's also been like three years. That, that's what I mean. The, t- the length know. of time you need a refresher. Even I forgot most of the characters. They have little hints of the the one party member that used to be with the bow hero. That threw me off too. Not gonna lie. And I'm like because she's been the mo- uh, the number one critique of it. So I'm like, ah oh, man. Well, there's been a lot. There's a lot of. Well, that's the thing about this show is that there are a lot of characters. That's what I mean. Yeah. And I mean they're not like little throwaway characters either. They're like characters that you're like oh okay i remember that character yeah exactly or like oh i remember yeah. him and with her instance she's, it's very subtle when you watch the first, uh, because she's thrown in there you just have to look a little bit and I'm like oh okay same thing with the queen like i mentioned well his party has that kind of like bigot knight too yeah yeah that i remember i'm like oh i remember yeah yeah, yeah. And it ties in with the constant racism of the world, unfortunately uh, but it's it's an interesting aspect of the world and yeah. I, I like the way it's developed and I worry that, well, I like, I did like, so, and I did watch a few of the first uh, episodes, and I do like how now they're taking Nafumi out into the wider world. Yeah. And you see these people from these different kingdoms. Yes, yes. And how they're essentially acting the same way the Cardinal Heroes did. Yeah. Where they all have their own agendas, they all have their own interests, and that's creating a conflict that Nafumi doesn't want to deal with. Yeah. And he's not sure what to do going forward. He wants to go, essentially, he wants to go rogue and do things on his own again. Yeah. But it's not going to work. No. 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 The the challenges, are, I think, are going to get bigger and bigger. So it'll be fun to see where he goes. And it'll be interesting to see what the other Cardinal heroes are doing in the meantime. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because even the Spear Hero, he has a spinoff series, which is funny. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord. I know, I know. That's, that's... Maybe gives him a little bit of respect. I don't know. <laughs> but I would I, read it. I would read it. I would actually prefer if it didn't. I know. I'm like, look, if he if he just traipsed along doing what he did, and you know everybody's just like, this guy's a doof. <laughs> he's a total doof. He doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. I could see it being played for laughs, and it would be pretty funny because he is an idiot. Yep, yep. Yeah. 
So that was our discussion of Rising of the Shield Hero. Yeah, we, a great show. Definitely worth watching. Yeah, it's my all-time favorite Itsekai for a reason. And yeah, it's op- me opening up the closet a little bit. This is my standard for Itsekai. So, hey, you gotta watch it. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, guys. In this segment of the 950 Club, we're going to be continuing our anti-hero special uh, with the anime Black Lagoon. Black Lagoon. I love it, Seth. <laughs> this show, and I'm going to put a parental advisory all over this, not only the show, but this this episode of the podcast, because there's going to be some swearing and there's going to be uh, a lot of discussion about a lot of violent stuff because this is a this is a violent anime. Uh, there's a lot of shooting drugs, involved, drugs, sex, involved, alcohol, slavery involved, too. Yeah, child abuse, snuff films. So, yeah, this it's not an anime that I say uses this in a uh, exploitative way, which is kind of weird to say, given the graphic nature and content of this anime. These are just these people, and this is the world that they live in. Yeah, it's still a world where it's cultivated in a way of sh- shapes the tone, but it's also one of those things where compared to like Kill a Kill, which we just discussed, yeah. that one's just its own extreme in its own animation, whereas Black Lagoon brings it back, and it's more of this world. Black Lagoon's set more in uh, reality. Yeah, yeah. Then Kill a Kill is it doesn't go for those extremes. No. Uh, its extremes are in a different way. Yeah. This show reminds me a lot more of uh, Cowboy Bebop. Cowboy Bebop. Than Kill a Kill. Cowboy yeah. Bebop with the story beats and also kind of like the characters, motifs, and things like well, that. Well, I think that Cowboy Bebop... I, I'm not going to say that Cowboy Bebop wanted to be Black Lagoon. Yeah. But I think that that was... This is Cowboy Bebop with the guardrails taken off. Yeah. Cowboy Bebop in a sense of like... The, we do still have to do crappy ass missions. Well, these the the thing the, the thing about Cowboy Bebop is that they were bounty hunters. They were bounty hunters. They weren't criminals, but they did shady things. They had to do stuff in order to get what they needed at the end of the day. Yeah, and they, but they had a code. Yeah. Uh, they had they had lines that they wouldn't cross. They would only go for bounties. Let's put that. Yeah. They they weren't reckless. In Black Lagoon, there are no boundaries. There's no boundaries. There's no lines. It's kill or be killed. Yeah, survival yeah. of the fittest. Survival period. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you, you know, I mean, one moment you're here and one moment you're gone. One of the characters, one of the main characters, Revy, she essentially says that they're the Walking Dead. At any moment that, you know, their their lives, because of the life that they live and the place that they live at, they're already dead. It's yeah. just a matter of time. Yeah. And this yeah. is this is also one of those shows where it starts off small, at least with an the environment. Then it builds up, builds up through, through across the world in a weird way. It does, Well, it, it opens up like we were talking about Rising the Shield Hero. And um, the, the show explores not only the location that they're at which is that small um, Pacific Island. It also explores, uh, goes back to Japan. And I think that that's moving full circle for Rock, yeah. uh, the other main character. For sure. Yeah. And this show is very fascinating because it's one of those ones where it released over 20 years ago and it feels unfinished. Uh, there's two seasons and a movie as well, a small little OVA arc movie. And it's one of those ones where it still feels incomplete similar to cowboy bebop in a weird way but also one of those things where you're, you're okay with it it's it, it's had its own following apparently the manga finished the series i think but it's also a satisfying show just beginning then well i i think that the the place where it leaves you is a satisfying place yeah very much so uh because uh you know spoiler alert none of the characters die yeah uh none of the main characters die uh, when they totally could have. Uh, easily. I would argue each um, episode too, yeah. This show is weird in that there's an emotional journey from the char- for the characters, and I'm not sure... I'm not sure that you can say that they grow more as they, they accept... Uh, they come to accept reality. Their outlook, too. Like, yeah. their outlook morphs the reality in a weird, weird way. Even more so than Cowboy Bebop. Well, I, I think that there's a... And I, I think that Rock says this toward the toward the end of the second season when he's confronted by this character named Bella Laika. Yeah. 
she's kind of the leader of the the Russian mob. And he's just told her like, hey, I want you to do this. And she's essentially like, who the fuck do you think you are? Yeah. And she's ready to kill him because, you know, he's just there as her translator. Because essentially she's trying to take over the criminal underworld in Japan. And, you know, she's been doing this with military precision because, you know, she's an ex. She fought. When, you know, she fought in Afghanistan as a Russian soldier, yeah, yeah. as a Russian soldier. And so she treats everything as a military exercise. And so that's what she's been doing here in Japan. And he, he confronts her because there's a certain somebody that he doesn't want to die. And, you know, she says, he says something, he said, well, you know, usually people say something more interesting or entertaining when they're begging for their lives. And he he tells her something, and I thought it was really, really interesting and very, you know, like, telling of the show. At least the progression, because it's, well, it, it mentions it almost every episode, I would argue. Every well, I episode— think this is the, yeah. this is the this is where he lays it out. He's like, you know, Revy's in it for the killing and the excitement. You're in it for, you know, you want to make war. He's like, this is our personal choices. He's like— he says, I want to save this girl because it's my hobby. It's what I do. Yeah. He's like, you make war. Revy kills, you know, Revy likes to shoot guns. I like to save people. And Bella like a laughs. And she's like, you're, you're right. This is what we do because this is who we are. You're not wrong. Yeah. And so she lets him live. And it's hilarious and terrifying. And like, yeah, yeah. we're there. There we are. What? They made us. Yeah. Essentially, each one of these characters was essentially created. Yeah. By the society that they live in. Yeah. And they were kind of like set off, like set adrift into the world because the society that created them no longer needed them. Yeah. And yet they're responding because of that. What they're doing now is a product of what the society. And I'm not saying, and that's one of the important things about this show too is like, this is a choice. Yes. This is a personal choice to live this life, to do these things is, you know, they may have been created and they understand that it was those betrayals or whatever. This is who they are. Yeah. And that's, and this I'm, is what they do. That's what I'm trying to get at the end of the day, because from first minute you get, it's very harsh with the editing. It's very like, Hey, welcome to this world. And this is what you get. All the characters have a past. Yes. I, would, I would say they're wearing their past, but they have a weird, very weird acceptance towards what they gotten themselves into. And so with that first episode, we have introduced with Rock. He's our main character, a, bu- a business person from Japan. And uh, Rock, his real name is Rokuro o- Okajima. He has to uh, make this uh, business deal for his company. But guess what? There's these three pirates that uh, overtake a ship, <laughs> the ship that he's on. And he had this weird uh, request from this boss to carry this uh, floppy disk. But guess what? That floppy disk is very, 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 very important. Well, it contains information that could be used to blackmail the company. Yeah. And disgrace them and essentially, you know, hurt them. And so Rock is essentially his boss's lapdog. Yeah. And they've sent him on this mission. These pirates show up. It's um, Dutch... Uh, Revy and Benny. Yep. They are the three. Uh, well, Dutch is the boss of the Black Lagoon Company. Yeah. Uh, and so they essentially are pirates yeah. for hire. Yep, yep. They will hijack ships. They will uh, deliver, you know, people, whatever kind of cargo, illegal usually, for money. Yeah. So they've been hired to uh, get the cargo, uh, take the disc, stop the ship, take the disc. And deliver it to uh, Bella Laika. Yeah. Because Bella Laika is the head of this uh, Russian conglomerate, a Russian gang that is going to um, blackmail this Japanese company. Yeah. So his bosses essentially say, well, we can't have that. We need to kill these pirates and retrieve or destroy the disc. Yeah, Rock's life is not a consideration. Yeah, in it, this. and Rock is technically a hostage, and he's seen these yes. three uh, other pirates just doing their thing, and you know they kind of have this weird kind of like badass motions with stuff, like, especially with Revy. Very noticeably, or after that, Revy is a wild dog. 
and she is out for revenge right off the bat. And the weird part is that it seems like a basic hostage situation. It's like, okay, is this Stockholm syndrome? Rock says that. And it's like, okay, somehow, somehow I'm not treated like a hostage per se. Well, I, I think like now Fumi, um, Rock has been betrayed. Yeah, that too. By the people who he wasn't supposed to yeah. be betrayed he, by. He knows this is right off the bat, but there's a yeah. weird like surrender. Like, all right, at least let me see if I, I'm going to get killed by these pirates. <laughs> well, there's kind of like, uh, yeah, he does have that light bulb moment where it's like, shit, not only have I been kidnapped and I don't know if I'm going to die or not, my bosses have essentially thrown me under the bus. Yeah. And I, I think it's that betrayal. Like, I don't think he ever thought that his life was amounting to much. Yeah. Uh, I think he expected some kind of loyalty or concern or some kind of basic, decent human decency from these people, yeah. from his bosses. And they're like, no, <laughs> no, he's, you know, let's just cut our losses. It's just one life. Who cares? Yeah. And yeah, yeah. it's one of those. Uh, they write him off. Yeah. It's one of those shows where he just jumped into the drama and each episode, of course, you get that progression along the way because the first two episodes almost could be its own movie in a weird way. I agree. Yeah, because it's because he's abducted and things like that, Stockholm Syndrome. He's talking more with the pirates, getting to know their personalities in a short amount of time. Well, he essentially um, he joins them in a fight for their lives. That's what that's what I'm trying to get at because yeah. the first two episodes are very cool. Yeah, I like I commit like this is a rule for this show. You have to watch the first two episodes. The first two episodes are key. Yeah, at least with the tone with the show because well, it sets up everything pretty much. Yeah, you, you get to see uh, it's that old adage: show don't tell. Yeah, and this show shows you. Yeah, this show shows you exactly yes. what it's about. Uh huh. And it shows you exactly who these people are. Yeah. Yeah, and that those first two episodes do a really good job of illustrating that for you. Yeah, and basically with with you know the Stockholm syndrome, uh, Rock having this light bulb moment, being like, oh, "All right, either way, I'm pretty much dead." <laughs> yeah. But here's here's a weird twist. So the company that Rock worked for, with the secret plans, with the disc and things like that, they're pretty much like, you know what, we're gonna send or top brass to take this cleanly, like get this over with. It's just a stupid boat, whatever. We initially had good plans, but you know what? Let's cut our losses. Well, their plan to kill, um, their plan to kill the pirates yeah, and destroy the disc fails. Yeah. They survive. And I think this is one of the moments where Rock kind of like bonds with them. Yeah. Because they're going to die. Yeah. Rock kind of breaks. And it's in that moment that he breaks where he comes up with a plan yeah. to survive. Yeah. Uh, because he's like, okay, not only did my bosses essentially give up on me, uh, now they're trying to kill me. Yep. And he's like, why do I have to live in a world like this? Why do I have to deal with this? This is so unfair. This is not what should be happening. And of course, you know, Dutch and Revy and Benny are like, we yeah. don't want it. It's like, all right, whatever, kid. This is what the world is really like. Yeah, yeah. And so he he as he's coming to realize that, I think he and in that battle to survive he kind of bonds with them. And not only that, he realizes that he has no place in the world anymore. Yeah. And yeah. then what the company does to try to get rid of these pirates and rock, they send a helicopter and this helicopter is very fascinating because you think it would be like a simple, like, okay, it'll be like the monster of the week kind of feel like dismissive. No, this, this uh, helicopter has a personality of its own. It chases the hell out of that lagoon. The pilot. Yeah. yeah the well, pi the pilot, is essentially toying with them. Yeah. Because he wants to he wants a face to face kill. Yeah. He doesn't he's like, I don't I'm not I'm gonna toy with them. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. It's sadistic. It's it turns it turns from a simple a hostage situation into a full on cat and mouse chase. Yeah. It's quite fascinating because mind you, the location of this is Southeast Asia. Not too far from Vietnam, not too far from uh, Thailand, a lot of exotic, Some beautiful scenery. Extremely. Yeah. And the city that they live in is a port town, it's phenomenal. It reminds me immediately of Bermuda Triangle, that eternal mystery. Like what goes on in this world out there? It's literally a different world. Yeah. And that it's nice, like open ocean type of feel because you don't know where to escape from this killer helicopter. They find a little pathway in an abandoned uh, uh, beach. And even the, the helicopter had a, lot, a hard time finding them. And the helicopter pilot is very sadistic. So he's like, you know what? I'll wait them out. Well, he chases them there because it's essentially a dead end. Yeah. They have to go back and they have to face the helicopter. Yeah. 
and at that point he's going to kill them yeah it's rock that comes up with a, an insane crazy plan <laughs> to in order to in order to save him not only the crew but himself yeah and it, he pulls it off yep he pulls it off he manages to launch that ship into the air <laughs> And he manages to use a torpedo to take out a helicopter. Yeah. And it is insane. Yep. yep. It, this show is, and that's one of the things about that. This show is crazy. Yeah. This show is like, it's just insane. Yeah. The shootouts, yeah. the explosions, the battles. You, this show does not let up. No, no. In in going back to like ultimate cultivation with this show, similar to Cowboy Bebop, it's a hodgepodge of a lot of influences. And the biggest ones I could think of right off the bat uh, Robert Rodriguez, Quentin Tarantino, definitely Michael yeah. Mann, uh, yeah. uh, John Woo, uh, Wong Kar Wai, even little instances of that, at least with his action films. Oh my God, it's a perfect pot of all these action stuff. Yeah, uh, all, all the story beats, the gun love, the badassery, the machoism, uh, the seediness, the grittiness. Oh my God, it's it's a, it's a bubbling pot that you don't smell until you watch more of the show. It's it's a love letter to to action movies. Yeah, eighties, nineties, yeah. especially. Oh yeah, a little bit of seventies. Like yeah. Rock reminds me a lot of like those older, um, like Action Jackson. Yeah, kind yeah. of like a humbling. Uh, or even, like even a lot of this reminds me of like old Schwarzenegger movies. Yeah, yeah, Commando. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get that. You get that vibe of the weapons and the steel, and like the combat fatigues and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. but. And then, yeah, with that first two episode arc, that's pretty much like the explosion. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Because, like I said, it could be like one of those one and done kind of things. Well, it sets the stage for who these people are, what they do, and what this show is going to be about. Yep. It's going to be about them running around in that boat, getting (laughs) into all kinds of crazy shit. Yeah. And little by little, uh, the after the helicopter instance, uh, Rock has a confrontation with his old boss. He's pretty much dead. And the boss is like, you know what? Do your own thing. I don't well, even know your name. Well, he tells him, he, we asked him what his name was. He yeah. tells him what his name is. He's like, all right, come on, we're going. He's like, I don't think so. Yep. Rock's like, no, you guys, you know, you guys left me for dead. Didn't want to, didn't want to, they didn't want to negotiate for his return. Then they tried to kill him. Yep. And now they're saying, come back to us. Yep. yep. He's like, no, I'm not going to do that. And it's in that moment where Rock is like, all right, I'm essentially going to do this thing now. Yeah. I'm going to essentially be working for these pirates. And they very luckily take, take him in. It's one of those things where they're kind of like, okay, he saved our butts. Ah, all right. <laughs> I don't think, well, the first thing is, I don't think Revy likes anybody. No, no. She's staying off of Stitty. Yeah. She's just, like you said, she's like a rabid dog that, would rather shoot you than talk to you. Yes, yes. And so, yeah, she's just pissed off all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's one of those things where you're just like, it kind of wears on you because this show is, this show is definitely a show you can't, I, I wouldn't recommend binging. Okay, yeah. It's, it's one of those ones where because each arc in each instance it does take a toll. I do admit that. Yeah, because it, it is. There's a lot of violence. There's a. It, it's not only the action. I mean, there's there's plenty of action to keep you entertained. Uh, they tell some good stories. Uh, good one liners. The typical action yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you get good one liners. You get a little a lot of good action sequences. Very much so. Some of the best. You, you get already. some great puns. Yeah. Uh, you get some awesome death scenes. Uh, but you also, there's, um, there are questions of morality yeah, at play yeah. in this show. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times that they end up on the wrong side of the coin. Yeah. Revy and Dutch, Benny, not so much. You don't get it from Benny. Not so much. No, not ben, so much. Benny's the savvy hacker. Yeah. Type. He's the tech support yeah. guy. And so he he's kind of like the more like he's similar to Rock. He's pretty yeah. much not of their world, and no. he's also kind of like I'll just help him out. I'm, yeah, like, he's I'm, one of the support guys. Yeah, and he's like he's also from like a college. Like he's kind of like a quiet uh, influence. Yeah, I, I forgot where he's from in America. Florida, if I'm, or he went to school in Florida. Yeah, and he's Jewish too. Kind of like a weird background, anyway. Yeah. So after the first arc. Then uh, essentially, Revy and um, 
Rock have a showdown. Yeah. And that's where the show starts to... I didn't know what this show was going to be. Okay. And I thought it was kind of going to be a fish out of water show where Rock becomes a different kind of person. But no, th- this kind of follows the anime formula where Rock doesn't change. I agree. I would say he yeah. had a change of direction, a change of uh, fate, if you will. Yeah. He was meant to be it, but he wasn't meant to be it, especially in the world that he's uh, uh, he's been adopted by. Yeah. And the world itself is the one questioning him. Well, in the way that uh, Isekai works, essentially, this is kind of the same thing. Almost and similar to Rising Shield. So too. here yeah. he is as a businessman, and that life essentially ends. Yeah. And here he is in a completely and totally new world with all new rules and all kinds of all new situations. Yeah. It's, it's almost like... Uh, <laughs> An action is a guy, like uh, <laughs> like okay, you're in normal world now. Welcome to action world. Yeah, pretty much. It grabbed you from the screen, kind yeah, of. Yeah, and it is, and it is nonstop, and it is action world. Yeah, because these people live in a totally different world from ours. Yeah, I mean, it's the same world, but the rules for them, there are no rules. Yeah, yeah. There essentially are no rules. I mean, there's you know, there's code. There's a code, but it's like, it, it, you know, like you said, it's kill or be killed. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, with the showdown with Revy and uh, uh, Rock, it comes in a weird change of pace. Not going to lie, like, this is where I quintessentially tell you, watch the first two episodes because it's badass. Yeah. The next couple, I wouldn't say it's a tone of show, but it's a different adventure. The similar comedy bebop. Similar comedy bebop. But think of, like, longer episodes. Think of, like, an actual Longer arc. arcs. Longer arcs. Like, yeah. Well, Cowboy Bebop, I argue, only had like two or three arcs. This well, one because has like they 10, tend, 12, yeah. Well, because in Cowboy Bebop, they tend to wrap things up in one episode. Yeah, and it's yeah. A, it's like a small instance of a movie. Like, it's, th- it's quick, it's zany, yeah. it's stylized. In this show, it's a, a little bit more drawn out. Yeah. They take a little bit of time, a little bit more time to let you get the feel of the world and uh, let the story develop. Yeah. And there's like these background characters and other things going on, so it's a the pacing is a little bit slower. Yeah, it's like an anvil; it th- it throws you down. It does. It does. Yeah. Well, I think the thing that weighs you down is the, like I said, that that more the that morality where it's like, okay, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 sometimes it's rough because this is Rock's journey through this world, and this world is very different. The 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 rules. There are different rules yeah. in this show. Yeah, yeah. Like you, you're not. These people are not. They're they're coworkers. They they might be family. Yeah. You know, in a way, are they friends? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm literally not sure because there's a moment in this uh, in this next arc where uh, Revy and Dutch essentially he's like, you know, she's like, oh, you're gonna come at me with this professionalism shit too. Yeah. And he's like, well, I am your boss. And this is in regards to her killing innocent people, yes. torturing and killing innocent people yeah. unarmed. I mean, they might not be innocent at the end of the day because they are complicit in what's happening, but they're not armed. Yeah. And when she starts to abuse one of them, uh, Dutch steps in and says, what are you doing? Yeah. Are we going to, you know, are we going to, are we going to do this? Yeah. And you're like, are these guys, are they going to kill each other? There's a real que- There's a real moment. Where you're not sure. Yep, yep. And they even comment on the fact that they weren't sure what was going to happen. I know. The villain, you know, the bad, the quote unquote bad guys show up and you're left to question, all right, who are the good guys? Yeah. In this? None. 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 And that's at the end of the day, you realize Revy not in any way, shape or form a good person. No, no. Yeah. She's really broken and like. Sadistic. Yeah, to a well, there are things that Revy finds wrong, but there's not a whole lot. No, in she's had to live in this world her entire life. Yeah, and so these are the rules for her. Yeah, and it's like she's not gonna hear it. She's not gonna listen. And there's a moment where Rock confronts her with this. He's like, because okay, so the setup for this is that there it was a German submarine that uh sank. Yeah, 
uh, with a painting that may or may not have been painted by Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Dutch and his crew have been hired to get this. Yeah, by a to weird, retrieve it. By the weird guy from Spain. Yeah. To retrieve this, but so have a bunch of neo Nazis. <laughs> yeah. So this is who you're fighting. Yeah. So Revy and Rock go down. They, you know, Dutch buys some diving equipment so they can do this. So they dive down to the submarine. Rock finds the painting and wants to leave. Revy starts digging through the belongings of the dead. And he, you know, this bothers Rock. Yeah. He's like, what are you doing? Yeah. And she's like, this stuff, I can sell this stuff. And he's like, but that belongs to them. And that's a cool aspect of it. Because uh, for rewatching this, and I had to jump into the manga. It made me makes me want to read all the manga, uh, get the whole set. Because that whole exchange, because in the original watching this originally i thought it was a silly adventure because it's like okay not, uh new nazis you know t- 50 years later catching lost art it's kind of an adventure film but it threw me off initially it's, but reading the manga it gives a sense of revy having her philosophy set in stone si- since day one her nihilistic very like of this world this is what we have to do to survive she shows rock a skull and a piece of, or was a metal, a metal. Yeah. And she asked rack, what are these? And he's like, a metal and a skull. And he's like, no, these are things. I need to sell these to get money because money is the only thing that matters. Yeah. It's, it's it definitely is a flaw of Revy. I'm not going to lie about that. Well, that's her, that's her worldview. Yes. And she doesn't want rock coming in and telling her what to do that her worldview is wrong and what to do too. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, his, his morale, applying his morality to her and her world. Yeah. And what the way that she's had to survive in that world. Yeah. And it's, it's puts her on edge Yeah, because I'm not exactly sure that Revy, while Revy extols those values and that as her worldview, I'm not exactly sure that she's happy with that. No, no. It's, yeah. it's definitely of, like I mentioned earlier, how the characters are past or shown. It's yeah. there. You know it's there. But no matter how close you are, it's still a black void. Yeah. It's one of those rare shows you get that like conclusion at least. Well, yeah. they don't. They don't. I like that this show, they don't spell. She has some flashbacks and stuff, but you never really know None. exactly what she's gone through. Exactly. To make her this way, yep. Uh, you, but you got you think it's pretty terrible, but that doesn't. And I'm not saying that to excuse her or her behavior. Yeah. Uh, it just is. It, that's the reasons that she's chosen to follow this path. Yeah. And it's pretty bleak. It's pretty dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, the whole adventure with the Nazis, it's just what it is. And that's what I mean with the first two episodes. You get that sense of like adventure to adventure. Okay, you know what? Yeah. That might be not my adventure, but I got something out of it, at least with the characters' motifs and a little bit of their past. Yeah. You get you get I there's some really good dialogue like action movie worthy dialogue it's, in that whole sequence, it especially is. from Dutch. Yeah. When Dutch finds out that essentially what the what the person who's hired them, and I, I, I put that in quotations because <laughs> essentially he hasn't really hired them to retrieve the painting. He's hired them to essentially be a foil for these neo Nazis to see if they're worthy <sighs> of, you know, actually taking on the mantle. And that's the show in a nutshell. Too. And it's like, wow, yeah. that's kind of a mind, you know, that's, that screws with your mind because it's like, wow, that's messed up. Yeah. That's just the world they did to live in. It, Dutch yeah. has a weird acceptance with it because Dutch, he's similar to jet. What well, Dutch is transactional. Yeah. He's like, yeah, he, he tells the guy, yeah, fuck you, <laughs> you know, fuck you. And I, I wish you were dead. But I did the job. Pay me my money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so there's that, you know, like, there's that back and forth, which for a, for any show. For any movie. For any movie would be like, whoa, they went there. And yeah, they did. And it's like, I mean, the Django yeah. levels of like, wow. Yeah. Uh, okay. Petty violence, I call well, it. Well, not not petty, petty violence, but just the conversation that they have about race over the phone. That's it. That's it. That's because it. the guy, that guy, you know, the guy who hired them, he's like essentially a Nazi. He's a Nazi. Yeah. yeah he's a Nazi war criminal who has escaped, you know, uh, being executed. And he's rich. Yep, yep. And he, you know, yeah, all the pilfered gains that he got, and he's trying to get this painting, 
And, you know, Dutch is a black man. Yes. And so he has to have this conversation with this guy. And I thought that for for any form of media, it was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And Dutch is quite fascinating. Like I said, he's similar to Jet, yeah. kind of like the father figure and the steady hand for the crew and the mission guy getting all, all the jobs, essentially. Yeah. But his name is off Dutch. I had to think about that, too. I'm like, okay, that's a fascinating name. I immediately thought of Dutch ports. You know, how the Dutch back in the olden times, you know, went to Japan, lots of other countries too, to set up, you know, ports and shipping trades and stuff like that. Well, if I'm not mistaken, um, that's Arnold Schwarzenegger's name in Predator. That too, that too. It's yeah. also referenced with that. That's what I took it to be. Yeah. I'm like, they're referencing, <laughs> yeah, they're referencing old action he, movies. He's a big, tall, muscular, built up similar to Schwarzenegger too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. So I'm like, oh, wow. That that's, too. And that was, I mean, that was really, I mean, if you're an action junkie, <laughs> if you're an action junkie, this is the perfect show for yeah, you because yeah. there's a lot of action. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of gunfights. There's just a lot. Yeah, John Woo. John Woo's an unsung hero, I oh, would yeah. argue. So, yeah. Well, uh, if you remember, um, there's a character that shows up later, uh, Chang. Yeah. The head of the, he, the Chinese. He's definitely John Woo. He's, yeah. He, he reminds me a lot of Ron Car Wai, too. Like yeah. the, both of those guys, I believe, wear shades all the time. Yeah, there's there's a lot of similarities. Yeah, this no, this this whole show <laughs> is just references and callbacks to all kinds of action but adventure. It's own, but, but it's own unique take and a very rare glimpse of how uh, how weird and how black our world can be. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, it it, it kind of like it, it it sits there and it says, okay, like how do I get all of these action tropes into one place? These ridiculous storylines. And it's like. You know, it, it, it wants to explore these uh, it wants to explore these ideas and it wants to throw all this action in there and it gives you like, OK, what what about it, it's like I want this place where they're all just criminals. Yeah. And that's what it is. It's literally Las Vegas for criminals. Yeah. It's yeah. just it's like this. The whole town, the whole city is nothing but a bunch of criminals, whether they be bound. It, it's kind of like they're. In exile, it's like these people are too violent to live in regular society. <laughs> so they go to this place where they can just kind of be themselves. They all know they're criminals. I, I can't help but think of, uh, unfortunately, with uh, global politics, I can't think of Argentina with Nazis or famous Nazis excluding from there. Things like that. And they kind of has a callback with that because uh, all these people, they have connections. Yeah. At the end of the day, they they had a past and they have connections, yeah. which is sad. But it's also <laughs> well, it's criminals who are working for money and they need a place where the authorities won't crack down on them. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's what this place is. The place is called Ronapar. Yeah, fictionalized, right? Uh, I'm assuming it was one of those. Like I said, like the area is so exotic and so like unique. Uh, think of like the beach, the movie, the book, uh, kind of like its own secluded paradise. Yeah, and. In fact, the fa fascinating aspect of it, there's a bridge that connects there with a noose, it, almost like old timey Western kind of thing. And also, it's a warning. It's a warning. Yeah. And also, the uh, statue of the blindfolded Buddha. Yeah. It was like, okay, I can't see the evil. Yeah. It's gore. It's like one well, nice little uh, story motifs. Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of interesting touches yeah, to this world. Very much. Yeah. So. And then yeah, it's a port town. Trade comes in and out. You're talking about gun trades. We're talking about the black market. And like we mentioned with the first episode, we talk about Hotel Moscow. Hotel Moscow is that one that's the overseeing influence of that town and that world, yeah. too. Well, they're the ones that essentially the uh, Dutch and the Lagoon Company work for. Yeah. They run missions for them. Yeah. And it, it, it seems like they've been burned by, uh, let's see, I think it was the Korean gang. Yeah. That they were burned by. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, you, you tried to kill us. So we're not. Because <laughs> they're like, you should work for us again. And he, Dutch is like, no, you tried to kill us. We're working for Hotel Moscow now. Yeah. And Hotel Moscow is fascinating because they're most powerful. And they use all their uh, facets to the T. It intercedes with Black Lagoon because Black Lagoon is technically the smallest. They're the smallest. Uh, well, they're not. They're not really, they're just operators. Yeah. They're not really part of any crew. They're not, they don't belong. They're independent operators 
uh, Dutch has this torpedo boat yeah. that he uses to make deliveries, which is lucrative. And it's way. like, okay, yeah. I'm like, whoever has, he's like, whoever has the money is my boss at the moment. Yeah. Unless they try to burn me. And then it's like, all right, yeah. all bets are off. Yeah. And so that's where you find them in the, the next arc. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there are even moments where they go up against, they go against Hotel Moscow in order to make a profit. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, the other instances were you the different, uh, the different gangs. Let's put it that way. Because you also, like Edward mentioned, you think you see Chang, he's technically part of the Hong Kong syndicate. Yeah. You see this weird, very weird, uh, a fake church. <laughs> yeah. Then there's the Italian mafia yeah, as well. Italian mafia as well. Yeah. Uh, a little bit later, you get the Columbia cartel. <laughs> yeah. Talk about world building. We'll talk about like dark world building, yeah. real world building. <laughs> like they don't like they're every criminal underworld organization gets represented yeah. in Hotel Moscow. Like we mentioned with the main, the uh, main Bella Laika. Yeah. Bella Laika. Mm-hmm. So there are a bunch of ex soldiers who there are a bunch of ex Russian soldiers who fought in Afghanistan yeah. for the Soviets, and now essentially they're retired? You quote, unquote. Yeah, but they're the new players on the scene because yeah. everybody else is kind of like, okay, uh, we see her moving in on our territory. We don't like it. We want to take her down. And that that plays out through a bunch of different uh, in a bunch of different ways throughout the show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's the thing, like... Uh... Because I'm trying to remember that next arc. Uh, well, that's where... Well, in this episode, they get set up by the Korean mob. Okay, there you go. And he... Somebody comes to them to make a delivery. Ah, that one. But there. then they get ambushed by the six boats. Yeah. And six. then they have to take... That's where you really get to see Revy, like... Unleashed. Yes. Yeah. And it is... The, her nickname is Two Hands. Two Hands for what, Edwin? Because she can shoot guns in each... She shoots guns in each... She's a... You know, her she has two pistols. Yeah. yeah, specifically the Cutlass models. Yeah. If you're familiar with her gun lingo, <laughs> man, I am not. But <laughs> no. this show will teach you about guns. It's crazy. The fetish is the fetish of gun violence is apparent with this one. Yeah, it's a reality aspect too because that's how you operate, and and that's part of the black market too. So, <laughs> well, it, it's it's essentially they paint it as a cutthroat world. Yes, yes. Where like it, you know people are always trying to kill you, and that's what that's what Revy says. They're the Walking Dead because someone's always out to kill them. Yeah. For profit. Yep, yep. And that's what it turns out. I mean, when you know they like I said when the the guy from the Korean mafia. He said he tells Dutch, he's like, Oh, you, you should come back and work for us. And Dutch is like, You tried to kill us. I'm not working for you. <laughs> There's a code. He's like, Yeah, you double crossed us. I'm not working for you. I'm working for the Russians now. Yep, yep. And so he gets a third party to hire Dutch essentially to put him in in a, a trap. Yeah, yeah. And he's he sets a trap for them. And so yeah, I mean, they're doing it for profit because he wants Dutch, you know, he's like, Dutch pissed them off. And there were larger fish at play, and Bella Laika takes advantage of that. And it's always this interplay between what the big fish want and what the little fish are trying to get. And and our crew, Rock, Dutch, and Benny, and Revy, they're the little fish. Very, but yeah. they're also the weird, very weird. But they're useful. Extremely useful. Probably yeah. number one useful outfit. Because they're always getting recruited for one thing or another. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, they, they're efficient in a weird way, just their style. And it could be messy. It could be weird. Like they can make more problems ahead of, down the world, especially for Hotel Moscow. Well, Revy is, Revy is a disaster waiting to happen. Unfortunately. Yeah. Between her temper, well, essentially it's just her temper. Yeah. Her temper and her, her violent tendencies. I'm just like, you cannot do not even pretend that this lady can be controlled yeah. in any way, shape or form. It became useful or reined yeah, in. Yeah. yeah. It became useful to a point. And we're uh, for the point I'm referring to is the final episodes of the first season when uh black lagoon is involved with the, uh, uh, with the cartel for, for instance, I love Revy. Like I like how her, she progresses as a badass, uh, you know, cut, cutthroat killer. But guess what? She has to deal with this uh, hostage. That's a kid. And I think that triggered a little thing with her as well, because I, in the first instance where she finds out that uh, Black Lou is dealing with a, a child, technically a slave, who knows? 
she had a look in her eye. And that's the first instance where I feel like she could have been a child slave. I can see that. Yeah. And, and revealing, because we're still not sure of her past. I still have finished every volume of the manga. But it's also one of those fascinating aspects where, you know, there's something that she has to defend from herself kind of thing. Um, so she's okay. So this kid is, this kid is the son of a, um, of a cartel of a family in, um, is it Colombia? Or no, no, Venezuela. 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 There you go. So they, he's been kidnapped yeah. and they're delivering him to the cartel. Yeah. This is not going to end well. No, he's no. either going to be, you know, uh, used as a hostage or killed to send a message to his father. Yeah. This kid's life is not, and this is where you get into that morality again. And you're like, all right, what are you guys doing? And you're doing, well, we know they're doing it for profit. Yeah. They're not thinking about the consequences or the legal, the law is not at play here. Yeah. And this is the law of the criminals. Yep. yep. Because it's like, all right, man, what are we going to do with this kid? And rock, of course. <laughs> and Revy sees this coming a mile away. She's yep. like, oh, he's going to get all preachy <laughs> and he's going to talk about morality. And he's gonna talk, <laughs> this is going to bother him. Yep, yep. And it's already annoying her and she wants to shoot something because she wants to shoot something every time she gets annoyed. And so this kid, uh, of course, Rock, you know, is like, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Should we be doing this? Uh, and the kid looks for him, looks to him for help yeah. because they all do. Yeah. Because he, that's who Rock is. And like he said, it's his hobby. Yeah. He saves people. Yeah. And pretty much his role with the evolving with the show is pretty much an interpreter, but also kind of like the buffer piece with the business transactions. Ultimately that's his been his role. Well, because he, he, he still looks like a professional. Yeah, that too. He's with he, a suit and tie. <laughs> yeah. He, he's essentially where Benny is their it guy. Rock is more like their PR person. Yep. Yep. Yeah. He had, <laughs> a, yeah, he's like the professional face yeah, of yeah. this company. And he had a funny quote because Revy was challenging him to drink a game. He's like, don't ever challenge a Japanese businessman in a drinking game. <laughs> we had to drink for his bosses. Yes. You yes, know, so he's pro pro pro. Yeah. So he, he's like, he's not a complete and total pansy. Yeah. Which I was happy about. It, it, second yeah. time viewing, I realized that more because the first time I, I was kind of annoyed with them. But it, it was well, because in the, the first time around, you thought that that's exactly what this was going to be. Exactly that he was going to be a total pansy. Yeah, and that and you were like, how is this even going to work? Yeah. But watching it this time, you realize that he's not a complete pansy. No. And that's one of the cool things about this show. Just like with Rising the Shield Hero, it goes against your uh, your expectations of the genre. Yeah. And, you know, Rock becomes, while Rock doesn't become the uber violent uh, criminal that you think he might become over yeah. the, the course of the show, somehow he still manages to live in this world without it completely and totally changing. Yeah, him, yeah. Which I thought was an interesting creative choice. Yeah. Uh, I kind of didn't see the point, though. I was like, why why i mean i get that it's his choice yeah but at the same time it's like you could have turned him into something but then again this isn't you know this isn't a typical that's show. not this yeah. is yeah this isn't a shonen show well in general like yeah. th this is a weird, weird weird trajectory and you'll find out why especially in the second season well because you you get this show sometimes this show is about rock yeah and revy and then sometimes it's not yeah, I would agree. Yeah, it's, sometimes it's, it's about Bella Laika. The and bigger picture, I would yeah. agree. Yeah. Well, it goes, it doesn't sit still. Yeah. You know, the main focus isn't always on rock. Yeah. It's like he's there and he's, you know, an influence. Yeah. But at the same time, he's not. Yeah. And that's a good thing you brought up. Yeah. Because uh, during this uh, stretch, at least starting with this 10th episode, 10th episode, I would argue, till the end of the second season. It's not about the Black Lagoon. No. Because this uh, cartel that this kid is being kidnapped by, let's just say he has a guardian angel on his side. Roberta. Roberta. A wonderful, wonderful, wonderful killing freaky machine. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's that uh, Robert Rodriguez movie Oh. with Antonio Banderas? Oh, the Des Desperado. Yeah, Desperado. Yeah. yeah. She is, she's a Desperado clone. Oh, yes. And it, it is insane. Yeah, I yeah. mean, 
that fight between her and Remy. Revy is the best for the first yeah. season, at least. Yeah, I mean, it was. I was like, Jesus, this is crazy. Yeah, yeah, because uh, Roberta is, is dressed up as a maid, yeah. <laughs> but guess what? She has a really gnarly past. She used to be part of the uh, uh, special ops and things like that. Yeah, and she some somehow got recruited by Venezuelan cartel to guard this kid, and she changed the pace. She. Puts on a face. She's a clumsy maid. But guess what? She's here to save the day. And she's taking no prisoners. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She <laughs> she is definitely. And they they even make a funny joke about her being similar to the Terminator. Yeah. And yeah. guess what? And this is what I'm uh, also trying to allude to with Revy. At this point, this is where I question Revy. Because Revy was overconfident. It's like, there's no one badass like me. Like, she's breaking with a kid, essentially. Yeah. But this kid's warning her. It's like, yeah, the, my, my maid, she's 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 pretty strong and i think she could take save me right he's like what the hell is this so they go to this bar and this bar is a character in its own right because there's always shit going on in that bar yeah. <laughs> shootouts like every week kind of thing it's awesome that's <laughs> well, being blown up all the time yeah <laughs> so they they regroup there and she's and, facing off against the cartel yeah. yeah and then as they enter in door roberto's made her play look for uh she's looking all over town looking for her, her master and guess what Confrontation with Revy. And this is Revy's first test of battle wills. Ah, uh, oh my God. It's cool. And she's taken out. Yep. She's taken out by a concussion. Yep. Yep. It's a wonderful build because the whole time it's like a weird change of pace in a weird way because Revy uh, needs to be downgraded. She needs to be downgraded, at least for the show to progress. Well, I think that because she has been their way out. Yes. Uh, the so, wild card, essentially. Yeah. Well, she's been there. Like, her chaos has been their way out of a lot of different situations. Especially that boat scene, yeah. Yeah, throughout the first season that essentially they introduce a foil for her. Yes. And a foil for them. Yes. And they kind of take her out of the equation so that you get the chase scene, you <sighs> get the confrontation, and then you get Bella Laika coming yeah. to the rescue. Yeah. It was, it was... But all of this pisses Revy the fuck off. <laughs> She is annoyed. She is pissed. Yep. And, you know, you get Roberta's backstory, and that backstory is, like, cool. crazy. Yeah. It almost reminded me of the Major, major. from uh, Ghost in the Shell. Oh, yeah. Motoko. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. It's also the world-building aspect of it, and it's also kind of like, all right, from here on out, Revy's definitely not going to be one saving the butts. Even Dutch. Dutch is the most sound, but it's going to be ultimately a little bit more focused with Rock, at least. Well, I, I think that... Roberta ups the the playing she field. ups the stakes the playing field too yeah yeah well she's a foil she because I think that the creators they didn't want um they wanted to add some stakes yeah they're like yeah these guys are the most badass but there's bigger badasses out there in the and world more CD shit and more yeah. yeah so it's like let's raise the stakes let's give them a foil a Terminator like made <laughs> yeah let let's do a send up to the Terminator. <laughs> You know, all, and it, Roberta does all of those things for the for the show, but it also shows their dependency on Hotel Moscow. Yep, yep. Because they, they're, you know, it's like this, this. How are we? How do we do this? Yep. yep. How do we take down the Terminator? Well, maybe they could have taken down the Terminator if they had a small army. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's also the key aspect of the Roberta arc because it's weird trajectory because that's the end of the first season. Mind you, it debuted in 2003. It also shows that Revy's insane. Well, that's it. Yes, yes. Because it's like she is not going to let this woman go without fighting her. Literally. It's it, like she's like, no. Yeah. I have to fight this bitch <laughs> because she pissed me off. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, because the Roberta arc, it sounded nice little embrace back with her master. But it turns into 180. It's a funny little, uh, like a switch. <laughs> but it totally fits with Revy's character. Yes, she yes. would totally, I could, I'm like, that didn't surprise me. <laughs> it's like, yeah, she's going to fight this girl because she's not going to let that girl get away. You got off this easy, but not that easy. Yeah. And so they, they fight until neither one of them can stand up anymore. For a fist fight, yeah. And Roberta knocks out uh, Revy. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of hilarious. Revy gets like her comeuppance. But at the same time, you're like, wow. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. The Roberta, the killer t Terminator made. Say season two came Moving out. Moving into the second season, Six, yeah. Yeah, season two, three years later. And it feels 
still because it has the same intro essentially and the same closing as well too the closing i love yeah they didn't change a lot no no even the, the story beats in production too it's just a weird stall and i'm not sure 100 percent sure with history mind you we're talking about nearly 20 years ago where anime was still kind of like getting his footing down at least with distribution in america yeah even with the original production too if i'm not mistaken it was like a weird stall period because sometimes manga has to finish before the anime i think that's part of it too but the second season doesn't even include the manga or they at least they had to catch up with it. Uh, anyway, so with the second season, it's weird. It's weird. I'm not going to lie. Because right off the bat, because you, you thought it would be this crazy with the Terminator made. <sighs> it goes 180 with these killer twins. Yeah. And even I, initially, when I saw it, I'm like, ooh. It was yeah. a messy, messy beginning. Well, these, the, the killer twins, they pull a lot of, like, action stuff. And horror. And yeah. horror, but a lot of, like, um, what is that? that? What is that Nicolas Cage movie? Ooh. Uh, face off, it, face it's off. It's not 8 millimeters. <laughs> oh. Oh. Yeah. Good call. It's the one about the snuff film. Yes. yes. And they're, they they somehow they managed to work this into this show. Somehow, even for, like, standard shows, like, this could have been NC-17, like, territory. It, it's rough. I mean, there's a moment where, you know, Bella Laika has to, uh, because these, essentially what it happens is that the, the, the Italian mob has unleashed these, you know, twins uh, on Bella Laika yeah. in order to kill her, uh, you know, to take her out so that she can stop encroaching on their territory. Yeah. They deny it, but they have the kids and the kids are taking people out. They're taking her people out, but then they start taking other people out. Yeah. And everybody's like, what's going on? And uh, the Italians realize we may have lost control of this. <sighs> and they have because these kids are natural. It, it, it's, it's Bonnie and Clyde. It's it's like um, it's a natural born killers. Yeah, it's a natural born killers. So yeah. Good reference. The These two are creations the way everybody else and they're just too young to understand what it is they're they're yeah. doing. And this is a parent, and it is a story. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie, you you get something out of it. You'll still watch a show. I mean, it's 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 fun. Yeah, it's compelling. But is it dark? It's dark as it's, fuck. It's beyond my limits too. It for me, it wasn't. There wasn't any uh, like sexual content to it. Yeah. So I wasn't as repulsed. But I felt like Bella Laika after she, you know. Bella Laika kills both of these kids. Yeah, in a really gnarly way. Yeah, well, one of them is like a gnarly way. The other one's a a really fucked up betrayal. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what she they have they they, they have the resources to kill. Well, yeah. the, the the they've killed and tortured her men. Yeah. Like they've you know they've tortured them to death. They've tortured some of her men who are her comrades from the war. Yep. They're they're her family. Um, they're her brothers in arms, and so she she takes her revenge. Yeah, her her subordinate says, "Are you okay?" She's like, "No, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm exhausted. I'm getting tired of this shit." Yeah, well, she's emotionally exhausted. She's had to, you know, some of her, you know, some of her family has been killed, and she's had to put down two kids. Yeah. And it's a rough watch. Yeah, very. And that's the thing about the season two because original viewing. I didn't finish season two. It was up to that point. And I loved it. I loved it to that point. I'm like, Ugh. it was weird because I thought like, at the time I wanted to give it a break. I didn't go back to it. I don't know. I don't know what it was. Maybe I got most out of it anyway. But well, it's like I said, this show, this show is really well made. Extremely. It's really good if you like action and adventure. It's my favorite action anime. But it explores some dark subject matter, mm -hmm. some dark themes and some dark subject matter. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, Yuki. Um, what's his her name? Oh, the, the that's the later arc. Yeah, um, Yuki for now. Yuki. Uh, so she it's this, it's a character that shows up later on when they go back to Japan. Uh, when uh, Rock goes back to Japan, and she says she talks. I mean, she's a teenager and she's kind of romanticizing all of this, but she does talk about the night. Yeah. And she she confronts Rock about his choices. And she's like you you don't you live in the twilight. She's like you haven't had to go into the night. You don't know what it can do to you. You don't you haven't chosen that path. Yeah. And that's what there this show goes into the darkness. Yeah. And then I'm glad yeah. I we we finally like 
tackle this one because the second half of the second season is really good. Because it's, oh, it, yeah, it's, it's it's amazing. It's one arc, yeah, essentially, and it's uh, ties in f- almost for a full circle. That's why you mentioned like h- how you watch this. You can take out of it, and you don't need a third season even. Yeah, because uh, Rock he goes back to Japan. That's yeah. where he's from. And it's it's also an interesting change of pace because it's only Rock and only Ravi. Dutch and Benny are at bay. Well, you get that middle. Um, you get that middle. Well, essentially, this becomes the Rock and Revy show. Yeah. For most of this season. Yeah. Because Dutch and Benny are kind of put on the back burner. Yeah. Uh, they kind of show up to rescue them uh, because you get that one arc in the middle, which is essentially uh, <laughs> a battle royale. <laughs> well, the, yeah, the Italian mafia is back at it again. Yeah. Uh, they've tracked a counterfeiter that they've been working with. Yeah. Uh, to this city, and you know, they're they're the guy that works for them there. He keeps telling them like, "Look, man, there's different rules here. Yeah. You know, you can't like you can't treat this like any place else." Yeah. And again and again and again, <laughs> they keep running into that wall, yep. and it's like, "Oh shit!" Yep, yep, yep. And so essentially, the counterfeiter flees here. And gets Revy and um, Edna, the the Edda, the 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 nun, yeah, to help her out the fake church and yeah. everything. It's absolute anarchy yeah. and chaos. And well, you mentioned earlier how these uh, characters are kind of crossed in between. This is where you see all the characters you've seen from this point. Yeah, you see the deal, uh, dual wielding sword uh, person or sword. Uh, Taiwanese uh, model like killer. Yeah. And she, From that arc. Yeah, yeah. And she was referenced earlier in that season. You get these other fascinating killers like the Chainsaw Killer, Sawyer. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it, it becomes essentially a battle royale. Yeah. And that middle part, that's my favorite aspect of it, of the second season as well because well, it got to that point. Well, it destroys the, the, essentially the building that they, the dock. Yeah. And the building that they use as the headquarters for like, yeah. the Goon Company are destroyed. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And so instead of having like a rebuilding episode, they switch gears and uh, Bella Laika takes um, Rock Rock to j- back to Japan. Yeah, it, yeah. it also kind of, kind of ties in with language. And now this is the first time I've seen the show with the English dub. dub in the Eng- English yeah. dub. And yeah, it was, it was kind of cool. The you vo- have to read subtitles for the Japanese. Yeah, no, no, but that's yeah. the thing because when once you go to Japan, Rock is an interpreter. Yeah, and he this whole time you hearing this Russian mob queen. <laughs> Speaking Japanese, yes, yes. So she's talking to other Japanese people in English, in broken English, here and there. So it's a nice, like, oh, okay, this whole time, because yeah, you get instances like that where like, okay, I like this. this is well, he cool. gets he gets hired to be an interpreter, and you're yeah. like, that tracks because a he's from Japan. Yes, you know he speaks the language, so this is perfect. He speaks apparently he speaks English too. Yeah, and so this works as a transition. Yeah. Because it also works in that it works as a coming home for him. Yeah. It works as a transition because, you know, okay, their company's kind of been destroyed and they have to rebuild. Yeah. So it's, it's, it was a good, uh, I think for them, it was a good creative choice. Yeah. Not only does it continue on the themes and trajectory of the show, where, yeah, Bella Laika is expanding territory in different areas. Uh, she's been called there. It, it, everything makes sense. Yeah. You know, it, it, the natural progression of the show and Very the story, so. yeah, it, it, everything makes sense. Having Revy come along to be his bodyguard, somebody who's com- he's comfortable with, makes sense too. Yeah, all of these things make sense. And when you jump in the storyline, because at first you're like, "Wait, what's happening?" Yeah. But then when you start to think about it, you're like, "Oh, all of this makes sense as a natural progression of these characters and of the storyline." Yeah, and yeah. it was perfectly placed. And dare I say, for story purposes, for Rock at least, or technically our main character, this is might be his last chance to go back to normalcy. Yeah. Yeah. And he chooses not to. Yeah. And yeah, that whole arc is pretty much dealing with. Oh, another dark world aspect, especially yeah. in Japan, perfect Japan, the Yakuza. Well, now she's she's battling the Yakuza yeah. for control of the Japanese underworld. Yep, yep. Essentially, the Russians were supposed to, they they sent the Russian mob sent somebody to Japan to use these gangs against each other. Yeah. To gain more ground and more territory, they have failed nah. miserably. Yeah. And so they have this request from a low level gang who is trying to who has been disrespected by the organization 
and would like to, you know, gain some negotiating room, some yeah. push and pull. Like, like, hey, look, we're we're joining up with the Russian mob, uh, but we won't do that if you give us more respect uh, and more territory. Game of Thrones, Goodfellas, yeah. like, yeah, this stuff but never But Bella has plans of her own. Uh-huh. She's there to increase the, the Russian mob's influence and power. Pretty much getting her own privatized yeah. international so, army. Yeah. yeah, so she essentially takes out all the Yakuza. No flying Fs whatsoever. No, she. that's what she's there for. She did, yeah, no, that, she's got her game plan. Nobody's gonna stand in her way. That's why uh, Rock pisses yeah. her off. And earlier, I was having that moment, like trying to get what Hotel Mafia ultimately is. <sighs> I, at the end of this exchange we just have, I would consider them the villains. Yeah, like the overall villains. We're just not there yet because they're so, so close to Black Lagoon. We like Black Lagoon. They're shitty people, though. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, when it, when it comes to living in our world, yeah, I mean, I there are things that Revy would do that I, I don't find, that I don't approve of. Yeah. I'm like, I, I just don't, she pisses me off. <laughs> she I don't like her. She pisses me off. Yeah. Um, talk about anti-hero. Jesus. I mean, I don't even know that the word hero applies to it Revy? It applies only to Rock, but Rock has a weird steady progression, especially in the final arc, or final half of the second season because he's learning. He's learning how to be... Well, he makes a request of Bella Laika that I'm like, damn, dude. Yeah, 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 see? When he says he can't save her, when he asks, you know... Uh, Bella Laika to spare her. Sp- spare the he- new head of the clan of the Yakuza. Yeah. Uh, when he, oh, well, the, the, of that family. Yeah, yeah. Of that family within the Yakuza. He, uh, you know, she he gets she gets pissed off, but then he realizes, okay, a better approach would be like, why don't you wipe out the rest of this family, leave those two alive so they can't really do anything beyond that. Yeah. And she's like, that's something I can do. <laughs> but for me, it's like, whoa, Rock, what did you just do? Yeah. To, in order to save this one girl, they're going to kill like 50 people? It's like, that Blood, is... Bloodlust much, yep. Well, it, that's dark. Yep. yep that's man. dark for him. It's like, all right, you're not going to do any of the killing yourself. Dirty but hands. You're, yeah, yeah, it's like, well, I think in his mind, is like, these are bad people killing bad people. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like they're people, dude. Yeah. I mean, in the new- they might go to war, but they have honor, respect, and loyalty for their family. Yeah. yeah. And her family was a lot less. Um, they're more traditional. They're more respectful. They were more traditional. Yeah. But they did have their elements. That, that uh, Still Yakuza at the end of the day. Well, that blonde guy, he was a disa- walking disaster. Yeah. I would have put him down. Similar Itchy the if, Killer. Yeah. yeah, if I was running a gang, I think I would have put that guy down. Because <laughs> Me too. He's shooting his own men in the back as they run away. It's He's like, just aloof. He doesn't know his uh, place or etiquette even. Oh, yeah. He was a monster. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, this dude's dangerous. This dude's, he's stupid. Yeah. L- yeah. Literally Itchy the Killer kind of vibes. But, yeah, ultimately, it's a wonderful payoff, and especially with his arc. uh I won't spoil, spoil, spoil the near end, but it's also kind of like a nice, okay, you're getting a little bit involved. It's more surprisingly. One than, of the things yeah. that I liked was I'm like, the stakes were like, I don't know who's going to walk away from this. Uh, yeah, and it gives you that question too. Yeah, I, I'm was, like. Even Hotel Moscow, you're not it, too sure. Even though Revy pissed me off, I wasn't sure I wanted her to die. Yeah. You know, because it's like you kind of grow attached to her. In a weird way. In a very weird way. <laughs> It's like you kind of didn't. I'm like, man. She's well, gonna... the instance with the arc, she plays with the kids with well, the toy gun. Well, she 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 does have that side that she doesn't want anyone to see. Yes, she has her concern for Rock. She has her concern for maybe Dutch and the, Benny. the whole outfit. Yeah, yeah. Like she does. I, I don't, I'm not sure that Revy is capable of love in a way that normal people are she's far from normalcy but she has well, a... she's broken yeah she's really broken and you know she cares for people and she she can be human and so you end up you feel conflicted this yeah. show makes you feel conflicted because yeah she's a bad person she's a bad person who kills bad people she also kills unarmed people who she could let go because yeah. they're not going to hurt her. Yeah. 
but she revels in the the killing and the death and the blood and it's just like she's a killer yep yep she's a killer she's a cold-hearted cold-blooded killer and regardless of whether she has that good side or not she's that's still what she is at the end of the day yeah but you know you've seen her make enough decent choices where you're like i don't really want her to die does she deserve it most likely yeah yeah for, yeah. for good call like at the end if she had died in that battle at the end any of them any episode <laughs> uh, yeah but i mean especially the last battle yeah, yeah because true. i mean you want to i mean you want to watch the show and without her it would have been a very different show yeah and so that battle at the end you know you're like <sighs> but i think that the reason they survived is because who they are because who rock is really yeah because i think the the uh yuki essentially the mob princess i think she wanted a life she thought she wanted a life of crime yeah uh i think that's the direction that she wanted to go to that really reminded me of the professional you know i was about to say yeah. the, the music is very 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 professional like and there's yeah. a lot of tones with those the professional. two yeah it really that i was like oh this is this is their their vibing on the professional yeah. and that that movie also has a, a question um, of uh, normalcy like do you choose this path or you choose this path hey yeah. this path i don't blame you like don't go down this path because this is what happens. Yeah. So you, it's very, and then he, he shows that to the, he shows that he tells her that, and that's how, essentially that's how he defeats them. Yeah. It's like, that's not the life you wanted. This is the life yeah. that you wanted. And it's a verse coin because it, it comes to the point where the Yuki is the one questioning uh, rock being like, you know what? Yeah. You don't have to do this shit. But psychologically he gets her back yeah. to the point where she's questioning her choices. That's it. And he's like, do you really want this? Or do you just want to be yeah. with him? They, they both were on equal terms in a weird yeah. way. Well, she just wanted the life that she had. Yeah. You know, uh, Genji, yeah. I think is his name. Uh, yeah. The friend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the sword master. Or sword master, yeah. Yeah. She just wanted the life that she had with him. And she thought that she wanted this life of crime. She got, she, it excited her. Yeah. It excited her. But then she realized at the end of the day, all she wanted it to be was, all she wanted to do was essentially have the life that she had with Genji running, you know, the festival, the yeah, street stalls. Yes, yeah. yes. It's, it's, and it, yeah. it cost him his life. Yeah. This being an anime, she takes her own. Yeah. And so it, it's kind of like Natural Born Killers. It's it's like, yeah, Bonnie and Clyde. And they make the references to that, too. A lot. That, that yeah. one, in Wild Bunch, too. Yeah. And so that that's the way this closes. And, you know, if Revy had died in that fight, I think I would have been okay with it. Yeah. Because it was the last fight. Uh, but she doesn't. And they kind of leave it there. And, yeah, there could be more. But as far as I think the choices that they needed, to, that Rock needed to make and about who he is and what he does and why he does it, I, I think the show resolved those. Yeah, and yeah. it gives that lingering question too. Can Rock be a villain at the end of the day? Maybe. Big maybe. Hey. <laughs> well, I, I think that he's like Benny where he's there, but he's not a killer. And he's not that normal either. He's not no, he's not he's definitely not normal. Yeah. He's not a killer, but he's learned to see how this world works. Yep, yep. And so he's like when he wants to, he'll take advantage of that. In a way. Yep. And ultimately, like, it's one of those shows where I begrudgingly recommend it. It is my top 25 of all time. Yeah. No, I can recommend it. It's a good action show. Yeah. But it does have, it, it. the morality here is, like, questionable. Oh, yeah. It's like, dive in. It'll be fun. But it's not like, it's not like a lot of the other shows we recommend. No, this, no. Is, this one's definitely darker. We don't usually recommend anything um, this dark. Yeah. Uh, you know, we we've we've covered like with the eighty six, uh, even Psychopaths and Psychopaths. Yeah. But this one, um, 
this one is way more realistic yeah. than those. You but know? in a weird way, like I mentioned, it's, uh, it's all, also in the same, uh, almost same action sequence of Commando and Robert Rodriguez, John yeah. Woo, Lu, 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 the professional. Awesome, yeah. awesome action movies. Yeah. And you got some interesting characters. We didn't talk too much about the fake church, and that one's that one could be like another season for its own right. Yeah, that could be its own show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, just enjoy it. And, yeah, and, I mean, it's it's, <laughs> it's definitely worth watching. Uh, if you if you like action shows, if you like the, if you if you are a fan of all those movies, um, even if you're a fan of the Fast and Furious movies, I think you'll enjoy this. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely worth watching. Uh, like I said, there's some questions, but it, it it's a good show. Yeah. It's a good solid show from beginning to end. It's realistic. It does, you know, it, the, there's the character development. You get it's it's um it's a well crafted show with a lot of good music. Oh, very good music. Yeah, give it a, uh, check it out. Yep. Yep. We're gonna be taking our first break. Coming up, we're gonna have voice connections, manga recommends, in our new feature, best girl battle. Stay tuned. And now for our segment called Connections, where we look at the voice actors and studios of the shows that we've covered in the episode and what other shows and projects that they have worked on. Yeah. So for um, for the voice actor for Nalfumi, uh, Billy Kamets, the, uh, vo- In- the, English English, vo- yeah. the English voice actor for Nalfumi, Billy Kamets, he was also Shin in the 86. Yes, yes. Tatsuya in Vivi. Yes. And he was Ryu in Demon Slayer. Ah, cool, yes. cool. Very cool. I love that arc. And then for uh, Raftalia, the uh, Japanese voice actress, Asami Seto, she was uh, Fena, Fena in Fire Princess. Princess, Nobaru in Jujutsu Kaisen. She, she's also F in Star Wars Visions. Very nice. Yeah. And then for um, Black Lagoon Studio. Yes. Uh, Madhouse. Oh my lord, man! They yeah, Mad, Madhouse. Madhouse. That was like the first instance I watched the Madhouse production. Oh yeah, badass. Yeah, Overlord. Uh, the one you were talking about from last season, Police in a Pod. Yes, yes. Uh, Tacked Op Destiny. Mm-hmm. The one I like. I really enjoyed. I think they did Irigo Proxy too. Like they've been backing influence for over twenty years. Oh yeah, uh, Sunny Boy, No Guns Life. Yeah. Uh, one Punch Man. Yep, yep. High School of the Dead. Trigun. Yeah, Trigun. And then uh, also uh, from last season, uh, The Vampire Dies in No Time, uh-huh. which is one of my favorites. Yep. Yep. It, uh, it's one of those case studies where because of everyone else kind of like getting, the, getting their spotlight now. Madhouse is definitely one of the best influences, without a doubt. With, with, like anime would be like a million times different without Mad- Madhouse. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Without a studio like that, I mean, just generating the awesome content that they do every year. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't have as much to watch. Yeah, yeah. And what will be your ma- manga recommends? My manga recommends this week is um, Kaiju number eight, volume two. Ooh, volume two specifically. Yeah. Uh, so I have it has it's continued from the training session that they had. Yeah. In the the last episode, or the last issue, and now they're going into um, so they finished the rescue uh, of the girl. And he's become a kaiju. Now, this one raises more questions because there's a human form kaiju that turns into a human Hmm. where the main character was essentially forced to eat a kaiju. Okay. It's very weird. I have a lot of questions about this show. Or I mean about this manga. And what is it overall about? 
Well, it, it's okay. So essentially, we talked about. I think we talked about this before. No, no. Oh, okay. Like I read the first one by for the audience. Okay, so right. essentially, it, it's about this average Joe who works. Uh, so kind you exist in this world. Yeah. They attack the city on a regular basis. So there's like the kaiju defense force that fights kaiju. Okay. So there's this average guy, and essentially he works as the uh, kaiju cleanup. So when they kill these monsters, they don't just disappear. Their bodies are still there. Yeah. And so these guys are tasked. This guy is tasked with the responsibility of cutting up the kaiju and dismantling it and getting rid of it. Yeah. He usually gets stuck cleaning like the kaiju intestines, which is <laughs> it threw yeah. me off too when I read it. Oh yeah. So he so the 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 ultimate kaiju hunter is his childhood best friend. And they both made a promise to essentially kill kaiju. He has failed at this. Yeah. So there's a new kid in the kaiju cleaning uh agency who is determined to be, you know, determined to fight kaiju. And so he kind of rekindles this kind of like passion that the guy had to do it. Yeah. So they sign up together or there's an attack and they get hurt and they're in the hospital. And so the guy's like, man, I'm, I'm not going to make it. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm too old. You know, he, he's like 30. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, so him and the young kid are there and he's just laying in bed. And all of a sudden this creature flies in the window and forces its way down his throat. Oh. And he's like, what just happened to yeah. you? And so essentially he becomes like a mini kaiju. Yeah. Uh, this creature transforms him into a mini kaiju, but he's still himself. So he can transform back and forth, but now he has the power of a kaiju. Yeah. Like I think at some point they scan him and it's like off the charts. <laughs> and so this continues the story of that. And I just have like a bunch of questions. It's like, <laughs> where did that thing come from? Yeah. And it said it'd been looking. It's like, oh, we just, we found you. We've been looking for you and we found you. Yeah. So it's like, why? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of interesting questions. Kind of reminds me a little bit of My Hero Academia. I was about to say, it's, it's like My Hero Academia, like in the world of Jujutsu Kaisen, at least the monster aspect. I can see that. Yeah. That's a good description, actually. That's yeah. a very good description of what this is. Yeah, and yeah. like I said, I read the first one. And it kind of threw me off, but it's one of those things where, not gonna lie, seeing people reading it, seeing people like getting into it, is a slow burn. It's definitely I would consider a top ten in sales right now. Um, Surprisingly, for the first two issues in America, it's not breaking any new ground. It's not breaking ground. It's uh, like. It's not a top tier influence, not at the moment, but the author I'm on stick and has done other stuff too. Yeah, but it's fun and it's worth reading. So uh, yeah, check it out. All right, I will. Cool. Or at least check the second volume at least. Because the first one, like I said, kind of threw me off. I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm sold. Well, go for it. Yeah. And now for something completely different, Jack would like to do his best girl battle. Best girl battle. Bum, bum, bum. Yep. Epic music to add on later. <laughs> <laughs> Note to self. Note to self. <laughs> so, okay. So what is this segment and what do you want to do with this? Well, let's just say for your birthday special, it was like a nice little twist. I was kind of being mischievous. I was twirling my mustache. I was like, you know what, Edwin? What would be a good way to settle this? Settle the dust. Because you love Rascal Does Not Dream of Spun and Girls in the Pie. Yep. Especially my. You love Kaguya Sama Love is War. I do. And you love Kaguya. So you know what? Let them fight. Who would win that battle? And everyone's like, Ugh, I kill you, Jack. <laughs> I'm like, why are you doing this to me, Jack? Why? Mind you, Edwin loves these characters and he loves these shows. And I was being a little bit mischievous, especially on his birthday. You, you wanted to put me on the spot. Yeah. And it's like, I I was like, what? What? Well, you're trying to make me choose between these two? You're insane. <laughs> so I flip the coin back to Edwin. I give him a karmatic question towards me. Because I do love Raftilia and I do love Revy in a weird, twisted way. <laughs> so who would be the best girl? Now, before we get into this, do know that in 2020, Crunchyroll... She won Best Girl that year in the Raftilia. Crunchyroll Awards. Oh, yeah. Yes. Raftilia is a definitely a backing influence. And a little star with Raftilia because Raftilia technically 
is the one extreme compared to Revy. My wide range of best girl in a weird way. Uh, Reptilia is definitely of the most, like the partner, the one you want to be in the, in in this fantasy world to get you through it. She ultimately reminds me of Halo from uh, Spice and Wolf, the wolf uh, reincarnation deity in that show. Spice and Wolf is one of my all-time favorites as well. We're revealing all my all-time favorites. <laughs> and that show is... It definitely influenced uh, Rising the Shield has here, especially with the market and the uh, currency aspect of it. The salesman like stuff. I love that kind of dorky stuff. Halo's that character is very fascinating to this day. It's definitely one of my favorite girls as well. And Raftil is very close uh, uh, reincarnation of that because she's more of the a- action aspect of it, a badass uh, sword wielding adventurer. And yeah, her demeanor, her resilience, her dedication towards Nafumi and their quest, it progresses really steadily and she becomes a little bit more powerful than you know. Like a little bit later with the seasons, you get to see like her disadvantages, uh, especially with the world building and the monsters and the newer battles. But guess what? No, Nafumi, like in his own way, made her grow into this spectacular sword fighter. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other extreme, the other gauge of jack's best girl radar hour. because revy is a unique case uh closest one anime wise i can think of character wise is ryuku from uh kill the kill especially with the attitude the swearing the standoffishness but dare i say i put revy in the pedestal of purple hair anime goddess we're talking about the holy trinity faye valentine <laughs> my, my, uh, the major from Motoko. Kosa, yeah Motoko. and then uh misato and Masato is eerily might be one of my all-time favorite best girls. And they all have purple hair. That's a character trait. And she's like a morphed uh, manifestation of those characters. The badassery, the gun wielding, uh, the demeanor, the outlooks in life. The well, f- yeah. Well, I think Raftalia and Revy would be like the yin and the yang. Yes, yes. Uh, of the Because they, they kind of have the same background. Very. They were both abused. They they both. You could tell that there was a lot of loss. Bad was, past. Bad yeah, past. Really, bad, both bad past for both of them. Yeah. Um, where uh, Raftalia had Nafumi. Yeah. You're not sure what Revy had, <laughs> but they're almost like yeah, the 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 light and the dark side of the two. You know, of these two situations. Yeah. Like the two paths that they went down. Yeah. Yeah. And then Revy's case, it's one of those things where she's just of her own character. But she throws in philosophy. She throws in little outlooks in life, at least with Rock in uh, Black Lagoon and in her own twist away. And yeah, what what makes me like really like her at the end of the day is her action sequences, her expressions. Uh, Very unique. Even for anime, I would argue. Something about it just throws me off every time I see her. And like she had a similar face. She kind of has like that dour look sometimes, like kind of like frustrated look. Misato with her party side in a weird way. And then she's also reminds me of video game characters like uh, Jill Valentine. And yeah, she's a you can You can totally see the influences. Yeah. It's there and it's apparent. But if I had to pick one, because I do this to Edwin, <laughs> if I had to pick one, if I had a good son, if I had to choose one. <sighs> I don't, you're torturing yourself, I man. Am. I don't I, know I, I, how I, you're doing this. I'm doing this for you, man. I'm doing this for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I choose Raftalia. Okay. Raftalia is definitely best girl for a reason, not just because everyone else like can see her shine in her eye, especially her, with you know, how she's progressed. She's ultimately one of those ones that's still not finished. Revy is that case where she is like, that's her. Like there'll be maybe a change later. I doubt it though. Yeah. Um, I agree. <laughs> I, I agree. Uh, Revy. I don't see Revy being able to, I see Raftalia retiring. Yeah. I see her maybe having some children with Naofumi. Yeah. I see her being like, okay, the waves are over. I can retire. I can go to this life where I live this entirely different life. Yeah. I don't see Revy doing that. No. I don't see her being able to do that. Yeah. I think she would be bored out of her mind. <laughs> I, I think that she couldn't handle it. I, I think that, you know, she would, there would, in the back of her mind, there would always be like, 
can I get? Can I pick up my guns now? Yeah, can I pick yeah. up my guns now? Uh, can yeah. I shoot something? And now? Then even when she has those moments of being, you know, sound and being level-headed, no, no, no. There's eventually that switch will be off soon. Yeah, the bloodlust and the 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 need for the need for speed is yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. and she's the extreme. Yeah. She's definitely like, it's like terrifying how much like I, I am at like not attracted but kind of respect in a weird way. But it's like <laughs> that's a well, wall. Rob Talia can put her sword down. Yeah. And she never needs to pick it back up. There'd yeah. never be that need. Yeah. I mean, if the need arises, she'll pick it up. Yeah. Where with Revy, I think she can put the she'll put the guns down, but there'll be that urge, that constant urge, and that constant like, <sighs> yeah, that might make her insane. Yeah, yeah. If she's not shooting her guns like on a regular basis, <laughs> that might make her kill some yeah, more people. You know, twist away. I yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, okay <laughs> yeah you're your best girls man wow they can range they have range yeah or she's like just my kaguya and i like them too don't go wrong. wrong. so you yeah. know well <laughs> it's they're definitely different characters yeah yeah they're definitely different characters from um i yeah i don't you making tr- me try to pick that was just that was <laughs> torture that was torture dude <laughs> that was torture there's so many there's so many best girls that are yeah, like, yeah. another reason why i like raftelia is she's vo- voice same actress as uh, nobra nobra is a total 180 to raftelia yeah that range yeah and then uh maki was surprising in jujitsu kaisen zero yeah yeah she's i like her like that one's a toss-up too man. yeah she wins best girl in that movie yeah 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 and she puts herself in the running for best girl for jujitsu kaisen <sighs> easily and it's weird and yeah. it's like all right <laughs> and i think that's it yeah yeah for at least for this show yeah nice little change of pace we definitely went like we definitely are enjoying this ride we welcome for, for anyone to share our shows. Please like and subscribe, download, and just give give us a little time and day when you can. We do greatly appreciate it. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you're thinking. You know, like um, check out my art page. That yes, would be yes. appreciated. Yes. Uh, Eden Yeves art. His recent Ryoko is phenomenal. Yeah, phenomenal. I've been phenomenal. I've been working on the covers for the show. Yep. I'm really excited with what I'm doing. I hope you guys are excited too. I know Jack is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for downloading. Uh, We'll see you guys next time. All right. And for now, goodbye. Bye. Before we close our episode of The Rising of the Shield Hero, I would have to mention the sad news of the death of Billy Kamitz, the English voice actor of Nafumi in Rising of the Shield Hero. He lost his fight with cancer, and sadly, Billy died at the age of 35, the same age as mine. More I think about it, Nafumi is a very special character for me because he's one of the few, very few characters I can think of in anime. Dare I say, most of animation, movies, even real life, even that even though he's being down and gets bitter, there's something about his growth that is profound. And I finally checked out the English dub once we finally did our review of Rising of Shield Hero. I I was so enamored with the original cast that I didn't even bother with the English cast. And no shame in that. It's just how it is. Sometimes you, you like to see the original source. Yes. Then the English side is a good cherry on top. And yes, and there are times that the English is just as good as the original, if not better. Overall, Rising of the Shield Hero was a pleasant surprise, and Billy did an excellent, excellent, excellent job as Nafumi. You can really sense the bitterment and the anger, and at the same time, overlooking Reptilia and going on with the hero's path anyway. It's, it definitely had a range. When I finally heard the news that he had cancer and died, I, it just it was meant to be. It was a time and place kind of thing. It's kind of eerie more I think about it because... Me and Edwin genuinely love this show, and we finally wanted to talk about it. And, you know, this is part of the journey with our podcast. Me, Jamal, and Edwin, we all want to learn more about anime. It's been a growing experience of mine, too. And a guy like that, 35 years old, dying of cancer. No words can describe it. Pray for his friends and family. They're dealing with loss personally. And as anime fans, we're praying with you. And we hope that we did the justice Definitely check out his resume. His resume is actually pretty cool. He, Of course, he did a lot of video games, of course, with Pokemon and Fire Emblem, Three Houses. He did the English translations there. 
But also, he did 86 and Vivi, which we had a whole special about. He was the Lovelorn doctor in Tatsuya. He was also Nozen in uh, 86, which is quite fascinating. I didn't check the English side there yet, but I'm inclined to do so immediately. And yeah, he also won Best Voice Actor in 2020's Crunchyroll Anime Awards. The fans voted for his performance, so yeah, this is a really good performance. Trust me on this. You can check his My Anime List or his IMDb. Give him a listen. Give at least a couple of his projects down. And yes, I would consider Billy a true hero. So this is the 950 Club Podcast, and we're signing out. Goodbye.